Death in the Desert, Target Practice Mystery 7, written by Nikki Haverstock, narrated by the author. Chapter 1 As we pulled into the entrance of the North Phoenix Gun and Archery Range Complex, I was sunburned, dehydrated, and ridiculously happy as I held Liam's hand. He had arrived at the hotel that morning before we left for the official practice day of the Cactus Cup. I can't believe you surprised me. You weren't supposed to be here until later today. Liam had spent the week in Salt Lake City, helping his mom at the company headquarters, but I felt like I hadn't seen him in months. Moo licked the back of my ear with a loud slurp. I let go of Liam's hand to scratch behind Moo's ear until the gigantic black and white Great Dane settled into the back seat again. Liam gave me a sideways glance and smiled. Mom told me I might as well take off early. She said I was moping about. I'd have corrected her, but instead I packed up the car and drove down. I snickered at the image of the tall, handsome man next to me moping about. You should have told me. I wasn't sure when I was going to arrive. I made great time getting here from where I stayed last night, and it was worth it. He squeezed my hand. I blushed a little, remembering my response when I looked up for my complimentary eggs at the hotel. I had seen him in the doorway, looking like a Viking warrior, and I had screamed so loudly that Mink spilled coffee in her lap. Then I had vaulted over our bow cases to hug him. I made a bit of a scene, I said. I was not some teenager that couldn't control herself, but I felt pretty close as I watched him drive through the winding complex. I liked it, he said. The previous day when I had gone to practice, I hadn't paid much attention to where we'd need to park, but I remembered enough to know that our private time together in the car would be over far too soon for my liking. Well, I'm going to be a bit more adult from here on out, no more literally throwing myself at you. Though I assume that Ivana already told everyone that we're a couple, I'm not looking forward to seeing her again. Ivana had been engaged to Liam, I had made a bit of a fool of myself in the process of telling her that Liam and I were a couple, a fact that I had planned to keep private. Liam stroked a thumb across my knuckles. I have some good news about that. She won't be at this tournament with the rest of her team. She was offered a chance to be on some board of stand reality show and flew out already. Apparently she's enough of a celebrity there to be on something called Please Don't Let Me Be Eaten by a Tiger. I'll be rooting for the tiger. I muttered under my breath. I had no reason to hold any malice toward her other than good old-fashioned jealousy that she had once been engaged to my guy. Why do you want to keep us a secret? Not secret, just private. I just don't want anyone to look at us and think, why is he dating her? Luckily, the road was smooth and well-marked because he lifted my hand to his mouth and gave it a kiss. No one who looks at you would ever think that. And after five minutes of talking to you, they would know that you are the smartest and funniest person in the world. A man in a bright neon yellow vest directed us off the narrow paved road and down a dip into a dry riverbed and back up the other side. The bridge we had driven over the previous day was surrounded by caution tape, and a variety of people stood around staring at it. I pressed myself up against the window to try to get a clear look at the work they were doing. Yesterday, I noticed that that bridge swayed and bounced. I'm glad they're fixing it. We settled into comfortable silence as we approached the archery area. The nerves in my stomach doubled and tripled. I had been preparing for this tournament for a while, and it was finally here. I practiced my slow, deep, calming breathing, but it was really hard to fully focus with Liam so close. He pulled into the parking lot and grabbed a spot near the front but he didn't turn to get out. Instead, he turned to me. I leaned over to kiss him, but before our lips could meet, a rap on my window startled me. I let out a little yip, and Moo went nuts, barking directly into my ear. He was so loud in the car that my head rang from 150 pounds of Great Dane excitement. I turned to see Jess. Liam hollered at Moo to quit barking as I rolled down the window. She pointed at her watch. It's time for the team meeting. We've been here for 10 minutes. And yes, I did bring your bow despite you forgetting it in the lobby. I blushed a little at being caught for our slight detour. 
Despite being my old college friend, Jess was also my coach. I was in charge when it came to computer matters at the center, but she was in charge of archery matters. Liam leaned around me. Can we have a few more minutes? She perched her lips at him. He chuckled. I have flyers for the new AFA program that we'll be passing out here with all the latest updates, and Orion posted the information online yesterday. I gave a little squeal. I had been working on the Advancement of Female Archers, or AFA, project for a while, and we rolled out new information as we were able, since it was such a last-minute program. I had to admit this bit of timing wasn't ideal. I was supposed to be off the clock all weekend so I could focus on the first outdoor tournament of the season. Jess echoed my worries. I would rather you guys talk about it later. I want the team to warm up, discuss goals, and get practice out of the way. She tipped her head from side to side while she did some mental mathematics. Would it be okay if I had her for the next three hours, then after that you can meet with her to go over things? I'll take everyone to lunch, then those that want to rest at the hotel can, and I'll bring you guys back lunch. Does that work? It was stated as a question, but I knew that she preferred the only answer was yes. Liam was technically her boss, since his mother owned the parent company that owned the center. Of course, he could throw his weight around, but that would make him a lousy boss. He had hired her to coach at the center, and interfering with her plans would be undermining the coaching decisions she made. It was a complicated dynamic, but one that seemed common in archery. Archers had sponsorships and jobs in the industry, but those companies didn't want to compromise an archer's performance, since that reflected on the companies. Everyone tried to do what was best for themselves, but that often meant compromises about what was best for others. Liam nodded his agreement then looked at me. Does that work for you? I smiled back at him. Hey, you guys are the experts. I leaned over to give him a quick peck on the lips, then hopped out of the car. Before I could close the door, there was a crash and a squawk as Moo leaped over into the front seat and attempted to follow me. His tail smacked Liam in the face, and Liam's words were lost in a grunt of pain. Hold on, Moo! I grabbed his collar, but he overpowered me in his enthusiasm to leave the car. I was lucky to maintain my footing as he barreled over me. Whenever I got overly confident that we had finished Moo's training... I was reminded that at his size, his behavior needed to be perfect. He had never once snapped at anyone, and his growling was reserved for at least perceived danger. He never attempted to intimidate people or animals just to do so. He was still young despite his size, more like a gangly teenager still learning to navigate the world rather than a mature adult. Liam made his way around the car, rubbing a thigh and snapping a leash on Moo's collar. I thought you were working on the stay command. I have been. He now waits before eating. I guess I should work harder on exiting the car. It's not like we get out a lot. I smiled at him, more flirty words on the tip of my tongue. I was going to tease him about taking me out on more dates, but Jess cleared her throat. I raised a hand in farewell to Liam and Moo and grabbed Jess's arm to try and make amends for my hasty departure at breakfast. Thanks for bringing my stuff. I guess I was distracted. You know how young love is, she snorted. I slowed down a little. Love? I admitted that it certainly felt that way to me, but so fast? Am I acting like a fool? She rolled her eyes. Can we not get into this now? Yes, you're a fool in love, but so is he. You guys are clearly head over heels for each other, but can you just focus for a bit? This is your first outdoor tournament of the season, and you have trained so hard. She sounded a bit peeved. Please just set all that aside for a few hours and think only about archery. Liam will still be there afterwards. I giggled. She thought Liam felt the same way about me. I thought so too, but it was nice to get confirmation from others. He was tall, handsome, smart, supportive, and all mine. We had arrived in Arizona yesterday afternoon and stopped by the range to get in a few hours of practice at the unofficial practice range across the street. It would help us acclimate to the weather, which was a brutal shift. When we left Wyoming, there had been snow falling in a spring storm, and the temperatures were comfortably hovering at the freezing point. When we arrived in North Phoenix, the heat felt oppressive, though the locals bragged about it being quite nice. 
The wind shoved me around like a rag doll. In the few hours we had been out, I had gotten slightly sunburned and more than slightly dehydrated. My body protested that only fools would subject themselves to such a wild swinging climate in a day's journey, and I couldn't argue. Today, though, was official practice, during which we could get some time on our actual competition target. It was another opportunity to get used to the weather, though, as I followed Jess through the archer's area under the tent and behind the shooting line, there was an unexpected chill in the air and dark clouds gathered on the horizon. Is it supposed to rain? I called after her as she raised a hand in greeting as she cut through a group of archers. They are predicting some weather this afternoon. You brought your rain gear, right? She stopped to stare at me as though surprising me with a pop quiz. I patted my backpack hanging over my shoulder. Right here. I never would have thought to grab it that morning if Mary hadn't insisted we pre-pack our shooter's bag even before we left the center in Wyoming. She had lectured me that I needed to be prepared for every possibility. Should Noah float by with an ark, I would be ready to loan him supplies. Jess gave me a nod of approval and pressed on. I saw that at the far end of the awnings were the rest of the center's archers, stretching and arranging their supplies. I could practically hear the gears grinding away in Jess's brain, and I reminded myself to cut her some slack for her rather pushy and abrupt tone. She was my friend, and I knew her well enough to see where the tension was coming from. She was a coach. She often said that her responsibility was to provide an environment in which athletes had what they needed to succeed. But in the end, she had no control over their success. Her tension came from the pressure she was putting on herself to make sure we had what we needed. These athletes had moved from all over the country to train with Jess at the center, and people were watching and would judge the center and Jess based on how we performed. Yes, even how I performed. I was only the technology director at the center, but since I had started training and documenting my progress on my blog, people would be watching me too. And no matter how unfair it was, Jess would be judged on my performance. I swallowed hard and grabbed Jess's arm to get her attention before we joined my peers. Jess, you're a great coach. No matter what happens this weekend, I hope you know that we all think that you're doing a great job. She slowed and looked a bit confused. What made you say that? I gave her a quick hug. I should say it more often. You're a good coach. Are you buttering me up for something? I laughed and stepped back. Nope. Come on, we need to warm up. She followed me and still seemed suspicious, but did seem a bit less tense. I needed to remember to do that more often. Sure, it was her job to be our coach, even mine, but she still needed encouragement from time to time. The weather was warming up, but not like it had done the day earlier. As Liam and I had driven out to the range, the hot air balloons had still been high in the sky. As the day warmed, they would have to land, as the thorough dynamics that gave them lift were dependent on the cool air. I had spotted a large pink and red heart and a bright yellow character from a children's show next to a Bigfoot. It was the last day of some big hot air balloon contest, and I was glad that I could at least catch a glimpse of them from the range before they ducked behind a mountain. I went over to Mary and copied her warm-up moves, which, at the moment, involved windmilling her arms forward then backward. Everyone stepped aside to make space for me in the circle. For official practice, we were all wearing our Westmount Training Center jerseys. Minks and Tiger were chatting, though both were only half engaged in the conversation as they searched the parking lot and the rest of the practice range for familiar faces. Tiger was probably on the lookout for any pretty female faces, new or familiar. I hadn't heard that anyone in particular had caught his eye yet. But Minx was clearly in a different place. When she caught sight of someone, a variety of emotions flooded over her, ranging from excitement to disappointment, before she stopped and focused all her attention on her shoes. I twisted slightly to see where she had been looking, but already had a pretty good guess who would be there. Logan was a couple dozen yards away with an open compound case. Several beautiful women were chatting with him. I couldn't say for a fact, but it looked like he had swapped a couple pounds of fat for muscle. He had always been a handsome guy, but he was really in peak form today. He snuck a glance over at our group, probably at Minx in particular, and it seemed clear that despite her refusal to date him in Vegas, he hadn't completely forgotten her. 
and I knew that she hadn't forgotten him either. She was particularly cranky whenever his name came up, and her insistence that she wasn't interested in him smacked a bit of the line from Hamlet, protesting too much, to be fully real. I caught Mary's eye, and she nodded. She had seen the same thing. We had tried to broach the topic with Minx in the past, suggesting that maybe she did have feelings for Logan and she should have an honest conversation with him, but after she snapped at us to butt out, we had let it lie. I pulled an arm across my chest to stretch out my back as Mao slid up next to me. She was a part-time on-site athlete who would only train at the center on weekends, but still traveled with us. She was timid and high-strung, though over the past few months I had slowly noticed a change in her. It was as if the sharp edges were softening, and each week she seemed to return a bit more confident. She was young, just out of high school, so it wasn't surprising that she was still changing and maturing, but it was a joy to watch all the same. Did you guys see Indy? He said he'd be around here. She stood on tiptoe to look around. Are you two still an item? I asked. I hadn't heard her mention him in a while. She blushed a little. I mean, it's not official or anything. Just, you know, we're just taking it as it comes. Mary grunted next to me. I thought you had a crush on Mike from the college team and Jason from the Friday Night League, and don't you have some boyfriend at home? Mary bent over to stretch her hamstrings. Gosh, Mary, no need to be so judgy. I'm young and just having fun talking to people. Yeah, Mary, I teased. She's not some old lady like you. Mary was only a few years older, though mature far beyond her years. Anyways... Mao stood up and flipped her hair out of her face. I wanted to know if Indy was here because I think the two of you should talk to him. About what? I asked. His dad is a real mess and Indy wants to get out of there but feels guilty. I thought you guys could encourage him to reapply to be an on-site athlete at the training center. I hadn't heard anything recently, but I knew that Cole was on a road to destruction and that Westmound would no longer work with his production company, Cold Hard Facts. But Indy adored his father, and getting between family members was dangerous at the best of times. I can tell him about the center and answer any questions, but... I looked around for an excuse to change the topic, and Jess came to my rescue without realizing it. Jess was waving her hands to get our attention. Okay, everyone, settle down. I hope you all have your goals set for the tournament. I would like to know what they are so I can be prepared to support you. Tiger gave me a wink, and I braced myself for whatever joke he had planned for Jess. My goal is to meet some pretty ladies this weekend. Minx groaned. Jess won't accept it unless it's a smart goal. Fine. Then by the end of the tournament on Sunday, I will have three phone numbers of different girls that are at least a seven on a ten-point scale. Specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and time-based. I guess you have it covered, Minx snorted. Tiger, Jess warned. You know I'm messing with you. He gave her a display of his most dazzling smile. I want to focus on quick hands. My release has been sluggish, and in this wind I need a really snappy release. It's all written out correctly. Minx lifted a finger. Me too, fully committing to the form changes we made this winter. I know that if, I mean, when... I have some challenges. I will be tempted to go back to my old comfortable form, but I really want to stick with the changes. The tension around Jess's eyes eased as she looked at us. Mao grumbled that she was right in the middle of writing hers out, but Mary was prepared as always. I want to work on my emotional energy level. I know that I perform well when the stakes are high, but if I get too wound up, it's not good. I wrote out my visualization technique to use if things get intense. All eyes landed on me as I patted my backpack. My goal is all written out, too. I want to keep my focus on archery from the time when the first end starts until the last scoring round of the day. Jess obviously didn't feel my goal was covering enough ground because she added, And stay focused during official practice. No boyfriend, no murders. I swear, Di, this is serious. I grumbled a little. You act like I caused the murders. I'm starting to think you do. Jess's eyes narrowed a little at me before refocusing on the group. The target assignments are supposed to be posted by now. I'll go check us in and grab the tournament packets. Everyone keep warming up. I'll be back soon. 
She wove through the crowd while I grabbed a large elastic band from my backpack. It would give my muscles a chance to remember the motions of the shot while not under the strain of the bow. It strengthened the mind-body connection. I had just put my backpack under a chair when I heard Cold's voice shout, Di, we need your help! Chapter 2 The entire group turned to face Cold as he barreled across the parking lot, tripping slightly as he attempted to step over the cement parking blocks that designated the end of the parking lot and the beginning of the range. I tried not to gasp at his appearance, which had altered quite a bit since the last time I had seen him only a few months earlier. His skin was pallid and hung off the bones of his face. Pointy angles all over poked through his clothing, making it appear that when he had dressed that morning, he had left the hangers in. His coloring was off in a way I had seen before but couldn't seem to put a finger on why. He had always been pretty aggressive and pushy, but there was an edge to his voice and movements that sent my instincts into overdrive. He bounded over to me with an energy that made me fear he wasn't going to stop moving, but rather run right over the top of me. I stepped back rapidly, and he eventually stopped in the space I had occupied a few seconds earlier, not seeming to realize that he had nearly flattened me. Candy appeared next to him, radiating an uneasiness that reminded me of when I had accidentally bitten down on aluminum foil. Her eyes bounced around the group, only briefly passing over me, though I wasn't sure she had seen me. My skin crawled across my back, sending a shiver down it that had little to do with the breeze that had kicked up. Cold finally spoke, far too close, his breath heavy with cigarette smoke. I need to talk to you. I know your reputation. Come on. He reached out to grab my arm, the heat of his hand searing my flesh. I yelped and jumped away again, smashing into Logan. He steadied me with one hand while yelling at Cold. What are you doing? The people who had been nearest to us had stepped way back, while those further away had moved in close. My heart was beating out of my chest. Cold was setting off all my sensors. The energy coming off Cold shifted slightly, but still put me on edge. Cold glared at Logan before returning his attention to me. What reputation could he possibly have meant? You startled me, I said weakly. Sorry. He shrugged, though his voice didn't seem to carry much genuine remorse. Here, look at this. He grabbed a yellow manila envelope out of a backpack and held it out to me. Logan grabbed the envelope and gave it a quick once-over before passing it to me. I couldn't imagine anything that dangerous hiding inside, so I took it from Logan and stepped away under the guise of showing it to Mary, although it was mostly about putting some distance between Cold and I. A middle-aged man approached us, his eyes locked on Cold and Candy. He was wearing a tournament organizer shirt with Cactus Cup written on the left chest, but whatever was underneath was too small for me to read. I was pretty sure I had seen him scurrying to and fro the previous day, ordering people around, but we hadn't been introduced. Cold moved to intersect him. Candy split her attention between us before deciding to follow Cold. Logan leaned down to murmur in my ear. I was in the middle of something, but I can stay if you need me. I shook my head. Thanks, but lots of people are here. Holler if you need me. He gave my arm a quick squeeze and left. Cold was in conversation with the organizer, and I took the opportunity to snoop at what Cold had given us. I undid the two metal clasps holding the envelope shut. What is it? Mary asked. I pulled out the slightly crumpled page from the envelope. On top was a printout of an email, a few bolded words in the body of the letter grabbing my attention immediately. It was quickly apparent that whoever had written the email was very angry and had been more than happy to share those feelings in creative expletives. It wasn't signed, and the from field of the email showed a bunch of gibberish in front of an email host I knew allowed anyone to make a free account. I was torn between reading the email all the way through and checking out the rest of the pages. The rest of the pages won out, and I flipped through a few more email printouts and a couple of handwritten notes, some as short as two words that summed up the author's feelings about what they thought someone should do to themselves despite it being anatomically impossible. I was holding the pile of papers by the upper corner, and a half sheet fluttered to the ground. Mary, who had been breathing in my ear as she pressed close to read over my shoulder, picked it up off the ground with the comment, That cuts right to the point. I looked at the paper that contained the words, 
you're dead, spelled out in individual letters that appeared to have been cut out of a newspaper like an old-timey ransom note. I was starting to get an idea of why Cold was so agitated. You can't force me to leave, yelled Cole, jabbing a finger at the man who had approached him. I have a right to be here. The middle-aged man adjusted his wide-brimmed straw hat and seemed to fight the urge to roll his eyes. I'm not saying you have to leave, Cold, but you're not authorized any longer as media. You'll have to stay in the spectator area. I won't stand for this harassment, Cold spoke, not just to the man, but also to the crowd that was watching. You already stole my credentials, and now you're trying to ruin my reputation in front of everyone. Your credentials were approved through the national organization, and when they changed contracts to a different media provider, we removed STOLE! Reassigned your credentials. We did email you to say that you could reapply, but you never did. Someone is threatening my life and my business, and you think I have time to fill out your paperwork? Candy tugged on Cole's elbow. They don't believe someone is trying to kill you. Us, babe. Both of us. Our lives are in danger. People are scared of the truth, but no one cares. Except die. He swung around to look at me. All the eyes shifted to me, and the papers I was still sifting through, though I hadn't been paying much attention. A guy who was tall, even when standing near cold, shouted, No one is buying these supposed death threats. You just make stuff up because people are calling you out on your blackmail threats. They're not threats. I fully plan to out all the hypocrites in the industry. Cole countered, glaring at the man. The man was handsome, with crystal clear blue eyes that I could identify even from a distance, probably because they matched his blue Westmount jersey. When he turned to talk to a guy behind him, I was able to see the back, which listed his name as Woodchuck. I assumed that was a nickname, as almost everyone else I had met in competitive archery seemed to go by one. Woodchuck turned back to Cold, giving a friendly smile that didn't seem to reach his eyes. Hypocrites, of course, Cold. Not that you would know anything about screwing over your friends and colleagues for money. Moo growled next to me. I could feel the anger radiating off Cold. He seemed to be on edge, like a man ready to snap in a big way. A dangerous way. Before Cold could reply, the tournament official barked at Woodchuck. Not now! Woodchuck caught my eye before he turned and gave me a wink. I gasped. Cold was about to throw punches while claiming he was about to be murdered, and Woodchuck thought this was the moment to flirt? Apparently not everyone knew I was dating Liam. Mary leaned over to me. Stay away from Woodchuck. He's worse than Tiger. He winked at me. She groaned. Never mind. He's a million times worse than Tiger. Doesn't matter. I'm not interested. But I was curious about him and the accusations he had made. I looked at the papers in my hand again. If that interaction was any clue, there might be a hint as to why someone wanted to kill Candy and Cole. The tournament staff man who had come over to argue with Cole was facing me, and I could now see that his name was Steve. He was still arguing with Cole and Candy, though their words were lost as the wind briefly kicked up. Di, do you buy this? Mary took some more pages from the stack and continued to read through them. I don't know. I definitely can see someone wanting to kill Cold and Candy. But this? I had seen a few different names on the pages, even names I recognized, like Logan and Uncle Mike, in addition to the anonymous emails and notes. Cold had clearly pissed people off, as his name was on every page and often the subject of direct threats, but Candy's name popped up a few times too. I was tempted to write it off as an overreaction a bully claiming to be a victim when the targets of his antics finally stood up for themselves. But I remembered Vegas, which had only been a few months ago. Logan had been convinced a killer was in the loose, and he had been right. If more people had believed him, a lot of heartache could have been avoided. That made up my mind. We need to talk to Cold and figure it out. Mary snorted. Not right now. Jess will be back any second, and if she catches you investigating, she will cut you off at the knees. Steve seemed to be on the edge of losing his professional cool and shouted more loudly than I thought he intended. Fine, there's still time to get in the proper credentials. Get your paperwork from the car and I will give you the rest of the forms at the DOS table. But I'm warning you, we will be enforcing all the media rules at this tournament. Do not step out of line again. 
Steve stomped off, biting his lip to hold back what I suspected he really wanted to say. I grabbed the other stack of papers from Mary and started to follow Cold and Candy as they left for the parking lot. I'll only be a second. Cover for me. Chapter 3 I followed Cold and Candy while keeping an eye over my shoulder to make sure that Jess didn't spot me. Surely jogging after potential murder victims could count as part of my warm-up. I caught up to them at their car. It was a neon yellow sports car that had a noticeable rental sticker on the bumper. Not the most practical vehicle for the mostly dirt parking lot and roads of the shooting range. I lifted the pages to waggle them at cold. Hey, you need to explain this to me. Candy, who had been mostly quiet, only piping up occasionally in their fight with Steve, whipped around to face me. We had never been terribly fond of each other, though I thought that on her side, it was mostly that she seemed to view all women as enemies, impeding her goal to seduce every man in sight. You're the genius and can't figure it out. Someone or multiple someones went to kill Cold. She grabbed the pages while snarling at Cold. I told you this was a stupid idea. She doesn't know. Cold knocked her hand away from me and barked. Get in the car and fill out the paperwork so we can get our media passes. I'm not letting someone push me out. She did as he said, but I didn't miss the narrowing of her eyes at him and her mouth being pressed down in a thin line. It made my stomach roll as I thought back to how I had felt about my ex-husband. I didn't think either Cold or Candy was a particularly standout human, but certainly they deserved better than being stuck with each other. Cold pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket and mopped the sweat off his face. Die, just read over the email and notes. Clearly, people are mad at us, and at least one person wants us dead. You dead, Candy shouted out of the car, and I thought there might have been a whisper of a smile. He didn't turn around. Us. Candy is just as mixed up in this as me. What is this? I asked. This what? He replied in genuine confusion. The frustration in me was rising as the conversation continued to spin around in circles. You said that Candy is as mixed up in this as you are. What is this? Read the papers, he said through clenched teeth. You know what? Never mind. I held up the stack of papers to him and fibbed just a bit. I had only skimmed them. I did read them, and I can see a lot of people are really mad at you. And they all seem to assume that you know why. I can't do anything unless I know why. You have to play hardball with these people. Otherwise, they will walk all over you. They have this whole act that they are holier than thou. And it's all fake. Start from the beginning. I will look this over and see what I can do if you tell me everything. And just like that, I told Cold I would help him. I hadn't really intended to. Not until I knew more but my mouth was faster than my brain. He seemed to wrestle internally before letting out a sigh. You know I film at these events. I am the voice of the industry and have revolutionized the marketing of archery by providing high-end journalistic coverage of the events and interviews with the athlete, not to mention... I know, Cold. I am aware well of your impact in the industry. If I didn't throw out a few compliments, his ego would never survive. Good. Well, sometimes they forget I'm there, especially on the 3D courses. They get to talking, admitting all their dirty work. Maybe curse a little, badmouth a sponsor or wife or sponsor's wife. Throw a bow, that kind of stuff. I have quite a collection of this footage. A prickle went up my spine. And you are thinking of showing the footage? They are a bunch of hypocrites, acting all high and mighty, think they're better than me and Candy. He blustered and groused, but underneath it, I thought I could see a bit of a wounded little boy being picked on in the schoolyard. Maybe I had even been guilty of it a little. I know I had made fun of Candy's makeup and outfits to Mary at least once, and had mocked what a big deal Cold thought he was. Guilt rolled around in my belly. I'm sorry, Cold. And it was true that I felt bad that others looked down on him, though it didn't seem as if he was entirely innocent by any means. Did they know you had this footage? Did you say you were going to air it? I need to know more. He gestured to where Candy was sitting in the car with the clipboard. You know that Candy has taken over front of camera work. Well, she thought we should start a new series, something that would really get people to click. 
You know that a majority of my income comes from clicks, since advertisers have backed out. Candy poked her head out of the car and glared at him over the roof. Don't blame this on me. I didn't know what kind of footage you were talking about at the time. I thought it was like bloopers. Paperwork. He glared at her until she retreated with a huff. Then he turned back to me. I looked at the papers again. Hey, does anyone else know about this death threat? Cold shook his head. I haven't told anyone but Indy. I told him I would call when I got in this morning. I left him in L.A. to work on a project. I'll pick him up tomorrow. He knows, but I told him to keep it quiet. Candy said it came in the mail a few days ago. I picked up Candy at the airport. She got in on the 6 a.m. flight. She gave me the mail and I found it inside. But she already threw away the envelope like a moron. Candy, did you tell anyone? She glared at him. I told you that I threw it away. I opened all the mail and brought it, but I didn't even look at any of it. I didn't even see the letter until you showed it to me a few minutes ago. And no, I didn't tell anyone. He glared back at her. You just chucked everything in the back seat. I'm lucky I found it at all. Great, I interjected because they could go off on another fight. I don't want anyone to suspect what is going on. A cagey look passed over Cold's face. Speaking of sponsors, can you talk to your boyfriend? I know we had a bit of mixed signals, but I really think that... Die! Mary shouted behind me. I took the chance to escape the awkward turn of the conversation. I could get more information later, after I practice. Thanks, Cold. I have to go. But don't worry, we can talk more later. And I'm sure this is all a bluff. And if it wasn't, I would get to the bottom of things. Chapter 4 From my assigned shooting lane on the line, I checked the shot clock counting down in the center of the field and determined that I had enough time for at least one more arrow that round. During practice, I could shoot as few or as many arrows as I wanted, and I preferred to squeeze in a few extra shots each round to push my endurance a little. During the official practice day, I wanted to get used to my target assignment. Mary was two targets to the left, and Minx was on my right but I recognized a few faces from the Vegas tournament, and one girl, whose name I would need to get from the target assignments, was on my target. I wasn't exactly comfortable, but didn't feel wildly out of place either, which was surprising since it was my first tournament at the location. During practice, the whistles and clocks were being used, but beyond that, it was every archer for themselves. Both male and female recurve shooters would be using the same targets, though tomorrow, when the tournament started, we would be shooting at different times. We all waited behind the targets and took turns stepping to the line. I could go shoot on another target mat if I wanted, maybe one that wasn't being used at the moment, but I wanted to practice on my competition target. This was my chance to figure out where the clock was, which flags were best to watch to predict the wind, and all the other little things that were unique to that target. I took a split second to adjust my visor, low enough to block out the sun that was still creeping up from the skyline, but high enough that my string wouldn't make contact at full draw. I set my feet on the desert floor. It was almost as hard as asphalt, the constant breeze carrying away any dirt and leaving fine interlocked gravel. I checked that my hips were straight to the target, then angled my shoulder in line over my hips before drawing back the string. I had had the same shot technique since college. A lot of people had moved to angular draws, but I preferred a linear draw in which I pulled the bowstring straight into my face. No extra energy was wasted coming out and around. Or at least that was my theory. Plus, I liked my shot. It felt familiar and comfortable. I focused on coming into my anchor while resisting the temptation to push my face forward to meet the string. As I grew fatigued, it became more and more tempting to do so. Not that I consciously made the choice. The body was amazing at knowing how to make things easier. But archery wasn't about ease, it was about accuracy. I settled into the shot, focusing on aggressive movement from my back. I wanted the entire strength of my back to hold the weight of the shot and pull until the clicker went off. I felt more than heard the clicker coming around the end of the arrow point and snapping onto the riser. Before my mind could make any real decisions, my finger relaxed and loosed the arrow. My hand flew back, ending behind my ear. Strong follow through. I held that position, waiting for the thunk of the arrow hitting the target 70 meters away, three-quarters of a football field. 
Despite the lines of archers on either side all shooting, I knew when my arrow hit the target, though I had no idea how I could tell. The knowledge came from thousands and thousands of shots teaching my brain to know the rhythm of my shot. I leaned over to check the spotting scope aimed at the target face. My last arrow sat on the edge of the ten ring. Edges counted, and I didn't bother to hide my smile as I stepped off the line. It wasn't a perfect end, but I wasn't going to complain. I leaned over to put my bow on its stand, stabilizer up, and groaned. My lower back and knees ached slightly. The added nerves of competition, even during practice, had me tensing up all over. And the wind, pressing into my chest and attempting to push me over, then suddenly letting up, led to everything taking more effort than it had back at the training center. Everything was so different outside. I knew to expect that. I had competed in college after all. But it was a bit like getting back on a boat after years on land. I needed to find my sea legs again. The whistle blew, indicating that the practice end was over and we could retrieve our arrows. Minx came over on my right side after she wove through the spotting scopes in the shooting line. If you didn't bring it with you, you aren't going to find it here. What are you talking about? I asked as I rubbed my arms. The wind had been kicking up, and the sky had darkened in the distance beyond the target mats. I had considered putting on a long sleeve shirt, but that would require me taking off my arm guard and chest protector, then putting them back on, and until that moment, it hadn't seemed worth the hassle. Mary popped up on my left side. She's quoting a famous coach means that practicing at the tournament isn't going to fix your form. Only do enough to let you get used to the venue and get warmed up. I'm guessing that someone is ready to go? It's getting dark and I don't want to get rained on, Minx whined. Or maybe you want to leave before running into Logan, Mary teased. Minx looked straight ahead, but her cheeks turned bright red. Mary twisted around to look back at the shooter tents behind the shooting line. I thought that was him. Minx whipped around to look over her shoulder, then raced off, her face white. Chapter 5 I pulled my practice arrows from the target, deeply focused on my math as I added and averaged and multiplied to estimate what final score I would get if I continued to shoot that well for the rest of the weekend. If I could just iron out those rough scores, I could probably increase my end score by two or even three points. I felt elated at the thought, then tried to tamp it down. It was a dangerous game to count my scores before I shot. Instead, I focused on the sun that was warm on my skin and the cool breeze, which was much more pleasant than the previous day's oven-like experience. And if the weather held and I kept shooting like I had been... Are you okay, Di? Mary broke into my thoughts. Sure, why? You seem kind of out to lunch. I quickly checked my arrows for damage, then popped them into my quiver. A quick glance around told me that Minx had disappeared. Finally, I spotted her at the far end of the target mats on the compounder's side of the field, as far from us as she could get. We turned to head back to the line, where Logan was chatting. I guess I'm just focused on practice. It's going well. I think it's going to be a good tournament. She narrowed her eyes a little and guessed at what I didn't say. You're not getting your hopes too high, are you? Expectations are dangerous. Are you focusing on your goal? Quick hands and all that? Um, I blew out a sigh. I kind of forgot about that, but my form just feels really great. She was almost 10 years younger than me, but had far more competition experience than I did. She turned all that authority on me. Focus on your goal. You start getting mixed up in your score and you'll do your head in. On the line, form is all that matters. Got it, coach. I snapped back in my best imitation of a dutiful student, mostly to hide my mixture of embarrassment and chagrin. I was acting as if I had never competed. I had shot archery all through college, but hadn't taken it too seriously, as it had been more of a social thing. But since I had started training again in the fall, I had dedicated a pretty big chunk of my life to archery. I had competed in two major tournaments in the last few months, and yet, I was acting like a total kid, at least mentally. Whether I had a good score or not, my focus needed to be on my form. As I crossed over the shooting line, I lifted a hand in greeting to Logan, who was still engaged in his conversation, but he lifted his chin in greeting back. One pretty blonde gal was standing especially close to him, 
Her chin lifted high as she craned her neck to stare into his face. I wasn't sure if he was aware of the effect he had on her, since he seemed to be splitting his attention evenly with the other two gals there. I hung back to watch as Mary grabbed some water from the cooler Jess had parked next to our chairs. Someone I didn't know asked how her training was going. It seemed as if I had a few minutes, so I took off my quiver, chest protector, and arm guard to put on a long sleeve shirt. The clouds in the horizon were getting dark, and the occasional breeze was more common than the still air of the day prior. Even though the sun was still climbing, its heat was blocked by the clouds. The whistle blew for practice to start, but I figured it was the right time for a break. Noticing that my backpack was unzipped, I closed it up after grabbing a handful of trail mix. Or rather, what Jess called trail mix, but mostly was a mix of nuts that she had the kitchen make for us, because the store-bought kind was glorified candy. I wasn't really required to stick to any training regimen, since I wasn't an on-site athlete, but frankly, I enjoyed it. I might not have much sugar, but I had enough protein and fat to feel full and energized. I had even gained some weight of pure muscle. Being strong was a fair trade for some chocolate. Liam jogged up with Moo keeping pace at his side. Moo was allowed at the tournament, though they had requested that he stay out of the archers area during actual scoring. Mary said goodbye to her friends and rejoined me to hear what was up. He was holding out the leash to me even as he approached. Can you watch Moo for a bit? The wind is kicking up and they didn't get the tent weighed down yet. We were trying to, but Mr. Helpful is in everyone's way and causing a fuss. It's a mess. It was seldom that I saw him even slightly ruffled. I checked and the rain was visible in the distance. Uh, no problem. I was taking a break. I opened my mouth to say more, but he was already turned to jog off. I refocused on the gals and Logan. Logan was edging toward us even as the clingy gal tried to follow. He encouraged her to go practice and finally broke away to join us. Hey, wasn't Minx with you earlier? He asked after first giving each of us a hug of greeting and Moo a generous ear scratch. I shrugged and put on a blank face. I think she had some things to take care of elsewhere? He looked over his shoulder, then spun around. While there were a few portable trailers being used for administrative work behind the DOS stand, the majority of the field was visible. He squinted in every direction before determining that he couldn't find her. I've tried calling her a few times, but she doesn't return the calls. I think she's avoiding me. We nodded, but didn't reply that we knew she was avoiding him. A few months ago in Vegas, she had turned him down despite our suspicions that she, in fact, was sweet on him. He had stormed off and she had sulked continuously. It was all a bit melodramatic. Can you just tell her that I want to apologize? I assume she's avoiding me because I made such a big scene. She's right. I was a real jerk about it. I just... Uh, doesn't matter. I need to apologize and tell her that she doesn't have to worry about me asking her out again. I'm dating someone. He jerked his head back over his shoulder where the girl he had been talking to was still covertly watching and listening. I gave her a little wave and she gave me a quick, tight smile before focusing on her arrows again. She appeared to be checking her gear, but I assumed she was keeping an eye on Logan. Or rather, an ear. He was very handsome and easygoing in a way that made him a great catch. Not that I was tempted, but if I had been five years younger and hadn't met Liam, I might have had different feelings. He continued, Just tell Minx for me. We used to be good friends, and if I hadn't ruined things, I'd love to chat again. In fact, if she wants to go on a double date, I would love that. I bet Chicky would love it too. Chicky, as I gathered the gal was called, scrubbed her arrows harder, running her fingernail over the carbon shaft while her mouth was pulled into a straight line. I gathered that Chicky would not, in fact, love it. I'll let Minx know, I said brightly, internally wincing at the idea of telling her any of the info. I would probably make Mary do it, since they were actually friends, while Minx and I were more like frenemies. You and Liam are welcome to come as well. We're going to do this Creole place tonight after practice. Mary, I have a friend I can set you up with. He's been asking for your number, but I need to check with you first. Mary perked up. Logan wasn't the only person who had had romantic mishaps at the Vegas tournament. Orion, Liam's best friend and co-worker, had also put Mary firmly in the friend zone. Mary had been bummed, but didn't let it slow her down, since she had lots of other things on her plate. Who? was her only reply. Uncle Mike. He is a Westmount shooter. 
he turned around and searched the crowd before pointing. He's shooting right now, with a neon green bow and wearing a purple jersey. Oh, Mary knows him, I offered. I didn't think Mary would be interested. She had gone on a group date with him at Vegas, and at the time, she had told me that he was nice, but she wasn't interested. So I waited for her to turn down the offer. Logan was puzzled for a second before realization dawned on him. Oh, duh, of course. From Vegas, when you saved our lives. Sorry, I knew that. But the whole weekend is frankly a blur. The doctor said that it isn't surprising given everything that happened. Unk says he has the same. I nodded. He mentioned it. Just a few days ago, we had received a gigantic basket of treats at the center as a thank you from Unk. It included a note apologizing for not sending something sooner, but saying that he was still sorting through what happened. It had been a sweet note, not what I had expected from the boastful man we had met in Vegas. Perhaps I shouldn't have been surprised that he was still interested in Mary, since the package had been addressed to Mary, Moo, and Di. I had received third billing behind a dog. An amazing dog, but a dog all the same. Hey, Logan, how are you doing after that? I asked. He shrugged. Okay, I guess. Shook me up for sure. I didn't think Mary had caught any of the conversation, and when she spoke, I expected her to turn down the offer of a setup. Instead, she studied Unk, chewing on her lip. Did he tell you he was interested recently? Logan nodded. Yeah. I think what happened to us in Vegas really put things into perspective for both of us. He seems a bit more serious now. We've talked a lot since it happened. They had nearly been killed, and apparently it had been a bonding experience for them. I studied her a bit more carefully. Unk, as he preferred she call him, was a flirt with Mary. He had always been very flattering and fully focused on her. She took a few more seconds to decide. If Di and Liam go, I'm in. It would be nice to get out with some friends. I was a little surprised at the hint of hope in her voice. We were roommates at the center, and she had always been very focused on training, which she did every second that she wasn't in school or working at the center. I had assumed she was happy with things that way, since she never complained. But would it be surprising if perhaps she wanted a bit more? I would need to chat with her later to see if she had changed her mind about Unk and was considering them becoming more than friends. The conditional nature of her statement meant that all eyes felt on me. I will need to check with Liam, but I'm pretty sure we can go as long as it isn't too late and I can get someone to watch Moo. At the sound of his name, Moo sat down and offered me his large paw to shake. I dutifully shook it and scratched behind his ears, then scooted closer to his large body. The extra heat was nice. Cool, cool, Logan hesitated. You think Minx will? Circling back to the original question threw me off guard. I had a deep suspicion that going on a double date with Logan and his new girlfriend would not be her first choice, but she was incredibly stubborn and would never admit it. Or at least that was my guess. She was impossible to predict, and often I thought she made decisions just to annoy others. I'll ask her when I see her, but I do have a different question for you. I stepped closer and lowered my voice. Do you know the deal with cold and candy? He gave a quick look around, and when he saw that Chickie was close by and listening, he jerked his head toward an open space behind the tent. We followed him out, and I breathed a sigh of relief when the clouds broke briefly and the sun hit my legs. I hadn't realized how cold I was getting. What do you know? He asked. They came to us this morning and said someone is trying to kill them and showed me a death threat, but he was real cagey about why. I saw your name on one of the emails but didn't get a chance to read it. I didn't want to say too much about what had been said, partially because I wanted Logan's honest opinion and partially because I wasn't sure if I could trust what Cold and Candy had said. Logan groaned but didn't seem surprised. I was really upset when I wrote it, but I do stand by it. Be careful around him. He's... Unhinged might be the best word. He was never really stable to begin with, but he is mixed up in drugs and blackmail, at the least. In fact, you might want to leave them be. Focus on your tournament and let the chips fall where they may. You think I should let them die? He winced. No, that's not. I mean, it could come to that, but... I mean, surely no one would go that far. They said they're getting death threats. I even saw one myself. He lost himself and thought. Normally, I would state that it wouldn't come to that, that no one would kill over this stuff. 
but after the last few months, I just don't know. I nodded. I could practically see all the events of the past few months. Being a suspect in one murder, then almost being murdered at a tournament, passed through his mind. He seemed to follow the same thought process I had gone through to reach the same conclusion. Finally, he nodded. I see your point. What do you know about this situation? Assume I know nothing except that he and Candy have been looking progressively worse and worse each time I see them. Mary, who had been quiet so far, agreed. And they have lost almost all their sponsors and contracts to cover events for the entire season. I turned to her. I didn't know that. Why didn't you tell me? I just found out in the drive over. I was getting info to my parents about how to follow scores and stuff this weekend, and they were the ones to tell me. Cold Hard Facts, Cold's company, isn't the official media source anymore. It's some new guy. Dude, I think? Dude? That's not very original. Dude. I drew out the name of my best surfer impression. Logan shrugged. I think it's some play on his last name or first name. I don't know. He's from the East Coast and we haven't overlapped much. I saw him around last season, but since I got the job at Anderson, I've been too busy to keep up with the news except for what our shooters tell me. And what have they told you? He rubbed a hand over his chin. Is this between us? Some of this, if it gets back to Liam, might not be so hot for these guys. I'm not even sure if they told me the whole truth, because I'm no longer their buddy. I'm part of the company that represents them. The man. I wouldn't hold any information back from Liam that he needed to know, but I knew that he didn't want to know every dumb thing their shooters did. We had discussed that before. I bounced my head left and right as I thought. I won't share anything unless I have to. Fair enough. I did send that email to Cold about threatening a friend of mine that is sponsored. I don't want to be used as some pawn in the whole process. The only archers talking to me are ones that don't have anything too bad. Let me back up a bit. Last season on the 3D circuit, Cold Hard Facts was out filming. He followed a few of the pro groups. He tagged along with my group a few times, and after a while, you forget he was there. Unlike the tournaments I had shot recently and in college where archers were assigned a shooting spot and stayed in that location throughout the day, the 3D tournaments were set up more like a golf course. Teams moved, usually through the forest, from target to target in small groups. Logan continued. I almost fouled up a few times when he was filming. You know, you're in this heated battle for placement, then misjudge the distance and hit a bit too high or low. Then you consider dropping an F-bomb, thinking you're out there alone with no audience. Then you turn and see that big old lens staring at you and you're glad you held back. It wouldn't be the end of the world if that footage gets out, but I would need to apologize to my sponsors and that whole thing. Even back then, I wondered what would happen if Cold caught something like that. Would he air it for the views or hold back out of respect? And he's not holding back anymore? So he says, and a few people are pretty worried. Like I said earlier... I got a few calls from friends who are worried that he caught them cussing or something, but I'm not worried about that. We're adults and most people understand that pro archers aren't as polished as they try to be. If that gets out, they will apologize for losing their temper and it'll blow over even if they're embarrassed. But I'm worried about the rumors I've heard. Guys throwing their bows in anger, which no sponsor would be happy to see, and they could be forced to drop the guy. I thought it over, sorting through how deeply that could affect someone's life. I knew that some athletes bounced between companies to see who paid the best contingency money if they won an event, or even a flat-out salary if they felt the archer was a big enough draw. Having multiple companies bidding could raise the number in the contracts they were offered. On the other hand, if a number of companies dropped an archer, fewer companies would want to come forward to offer contracts, and likely those they did offer would have much lower numbers. If someone was living on the edge financially, that could be the difference between eating three square meals a day and declaring bankruptcy. I tried to drag my attention back to Logan to ask questions while I still had the chance. You know this happened, or is it just speculation? I have confirmation that it happened at least twice, but I suspect it could be more archers than those two. Guys that throw their bows or arrows, badmouth the company outright, or implicated in an epic rant. No women or are you using guys as a slang? He laughed. Just guys. Cold didn't feel the women were important enough to watch. Lucky them, I snarked. I need some names. 
I cut a look to Mary, who pulled her phone out to record while I leaned over to pet Moo. Mary was the official note-taker of our crime-fighting duo. I was the Moo Wrangler. He grunted. I mean, it's all rumors, but I heard the story from Uncle Mike, though he kept it pretty vague. I did some digging, and I think that Woodchuck was there, too. Maybe in the same group or the group behind him who were waiting at the stake. I was kind of hoping the whole thing would go away. Uh, he looked around to see who he could spot. I think that might be the only people who are here from that tournament. I know Frank and Beans were in the group, but I don't think they're coming this weekend. They only shoot indoor season in 3D. But the judge was also there, and I saw him somewhere. Logan looked around and pointed at the man I had seen talking, or rather, fighting, with Cold about his media pass. There he is. His name's Steve, and he's running the tournament. I made a mental note to see if I could find a reason to talk to Steve about the media pass in the tournament. But there are some even worse rumors, Logan said. I waited for him to continue, but instead he stopped as a red blush crept up his face. Go on, Logan. Uh, this is probably just mean gossip. But someone heard that. I can't say this. It's probably not true. Let us figure it out. No way, he barked more loudly than he had intended. Head swiveled around to stare at us, and Chicky was half out of her seat to come over when he waved her back and mouthed that he was okay. He sighed and continued. What I mean is that this is dangerous if it's true. I shouldn't have brought it up. We will probably hear it eventually. Besides, we know it is bad if someone is willing to kill over it, I reasoned. If you tell us now, I will know enough to be careful around certain topics. Otherwise, I might go blundering into something without realizing it. You know how gossip is around here. I wasn't even sure what that meant, other than archers love doing two things at tournaments, complaining about how they normally shoot better, and gossiping, though they would not call it gossiping. That was for naughty junior hires. It was more like they caught each other up on important facts related to the archery industry. But gossip, by any other name, still smells as sweet. He weighed my argument. Okay, as long as you use this to stay away from the topic. This isn't some little thing. This can ruin lives. I understand. I assumed as much with the death threats. He checked around to make sure that no one was listening before leaning in. There is a rumor that Cole got footage of someone in bed with a woman other than their wife. I sucked air in through my teeth and looked at Mary. Moo let out a low, woo. It was fair to say we were all shocked. Who? No one knows. I heard it from someone that heard it from a person, that kind of thing. Oh, hey. He looked past us and frowned before looking back to us. I have to go. I told Woodchuck that I would talk to him about the newest bow models. I turned to see Woodchuck, and if my guess was right, he had been staring at my butt. He looked up, caught my eye, and winked again before leaving with Logan. They were already in discussion before getting under the tents. Is everyone in archery a total horn dog? I asked Mary. She shrugged. Not all of them, but far, far too many. They get away for the weekend and it's party time. She jerked her head. A moment later, there was a flash of lightning with a simultaneous crash of thunder. Then the heavens opened and a sheet of water fell on us. Chapter 6 I had known that rain was likely, but not like that. I had expected maybe some little sprinkles and the occasional flash of thunder, but that was not the case. The storm had kicked down the metaphorical door and come in with guns blazing. The initial combination of lightning and thunder had struck everyone momentarily blind and deaf, only to send them running with the follow-up crack a few seconds later. Rain hit the dry desert ground in large droplets and beat into my exposed flesh with an intensity that I thought impossible. Moo howled and pulled on the leash, and I was barely able to get under the tents before we were soaked through. Multiple whistles blew, signaling that shooting was to stop immediately, though the announcement was lost in the rain, the shouting, and the rain beating down on top of the tent. Lightning was an automatic halt to practice. Mary raced up to me, both her bow and my own in her hands. Wipe them down. I'll grab our spotting scopes. I tore open my backpack to grab a hand towel I had brought and started wiping the moisture off the bows. I paid special attention to the arrow rest and plunger button, where a bit of water inside could cause all kinds of issues. But I had to split my attention because Moo kept trying to crawl into my lap, his body shaking with fear as another crack of thunder peeled overhead. 
He stood under me as I bent over. I attempted to hug him on either side of his ribs with the backs of my arms and the top of my thighs while continuing to dry our gear, and it seemed to be okay. Mary came back with our scopes, and I tossed her the spare towel. I can't believe this, I shouted at her. The rain hitting the top of the tent practically drowned out my voice. She laughed and said something else that was lost in a crack of thunder. A strand of hair loosened by the wind blew into my eyes as a large beach umbrella went rolling through the parking lot, barely missing candy. She was standing next to the yellow sports car, yelling at cold. She jabbed a finger at him, and he shouted something back. I assumed I was reading their body language correctly since there was no chance I could hear anything. She threw her hands into the air and stomped off, pulling her neon yellow jacket hood over her head and taking a path off the side of the parking lot. The visibility was such that she practically disappeared. A moment later, Cold's yellow sports car pulled out of the parking spot so quickly that it fishtailed, then roared out of the lot. Did you see that? I turned to Mary, only to realize she was talking to Jess. Jess stepped over to me, water dripping off her visor and mascara smudging under her eyes. Shouting to make sure she could be heard, she said, We're going to get some food. Mary said she will stay with you if you're planning on staying. Yeah, I'm staying, but can you bring me back something? I'll text you once we decide where to eat. Stay warm. She hitched her jacket up over her head and jogged to the van, pausing as another car left. Minx and Tiger were close behind her. They weren't the only people who had decided to take the rain as a sign to grab food. All over the parking lot, cars were backing up and slowly moving in a steady stream toward the exit. People were driving a lot more carefully than Cole had been. I had hoped to get more details from him, but maybe it was just as well. He was hardly forthcoming and unbiased. And while I didn't feel that murder was the solution, he was not innocent either. Things slowly settled down as the rain shifted from the quick build an arc level of intensity to just a steady downpour. The front of the storm had moved past us, taking with it the thunder, lightning, and the wind, but leaving heavy rain falling. The parking lot was emptier than it had been, but the tent was still reasonably crowded with the people who remained, along with all of our equipment. The tents ran from one end of the field to the other. Mary? I waited for her to finish wiping down her already dry bow and turned to me before I continued. Logan mentioned that Uncle Mike was there whenever the incident occurred. I gave little finger quotes since we still weren't fully aware what happened. I doubt he was involved, she said a bit too quickly. Oh, really? I replied, letting it hang in the air. When a slow blush crept up her face, I knew she had guessed at the underlying question. She scratched Moo under his chin, avoiding my eyes. I can't possibly know that he wasn't involved, but if I went with my gut... And I'm allowed to go on a date with a guy. It is nice to be pursued by someone. Maybe I didn't give enough of a chance. Is it so hard to believe that a guy would chase me? I know I'm not as pretty as you, but... Whoa, 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 whoa. Where did this come from? Mary, I think you're beautiful. Really, truly. No, I know you are beautiful. Jeez, why wouldn't I? I blew out a raspberry. I know you are. I know I am. I don't know why I'm getting worked up. Let's go grill Unk. She started to walk away and my stomach twisted. Why hadn't I handled this better? I was older and should be smarter. No, wait, we can talk for a minute first. I waited for her to turn back around and reluctantly flop in a seat. What's going on? Is this about Orion? Did I do something to upset you? She scrubbed her face. I don't know. I didn't think I was interested in Unc and told him so at Vegas. So to hear that he's still interested? I have never really dated. Do I even know what I'm looking for? I thought I knew, Orion and all that, but he doesn't. She looked as if she was on the verge of tears. I patted her knee. I had seen Orion's face in Vegas when he had heard about Mary and Unc going on a date, but that didn't seem relevant unless he was planning on talking to Mary about his feelings. And last I had heard, he was still dating a gal from his church. I gave her a big smile. It's just a meal. If you want to go and it isn't going to distract you, then go. I'll be there. We'll have fun. You don't have to accept a ring tonight. But don't do it just because you haven't dated before. Boys are more trouble than they're worth. She sat silently for so long that I was tempted to keep peppering her with platitudes, but instead tried to give her time to think. 
She eventually replied and even sounded a bit perkier. Oh yeah, even Liam? He isn't too bad. But seriously, Mary, don't be so hard on yourself. But maybe we should double check that Unk's not mixed up in this, just in case. Maybe I can use my feminine wiles to get him to spill all the dirt. She seemed excited by the prospect. I gave her a hug, squeezing her hard enough to make her squeak before I stood up with a bounce. Frankly, I was interested to see what a flirty Mary looked like. Let's do it. I stood up and was wiping dog off me when I spotted a man approaching. He had dark hair and was of average height, and he was wearing a black hat inscribed with the word DUDE in all capital letters. As if they didn't tell me enough about who he was, he was carrying a microphone and was followed by a lanky guy with a camera in his hand. Dude approached me, his eyes locked on my Westmount jersey. When he saw that I had recognized him, he called out to me, Die of the Westmount Center? I'm going to interview you. Chapter 7 I didn't even have a chance to assemble a reply before he stuck a microphone in my face and nudged Mary out of frame. He stood close enough to me that he could probably have guessed what brand of toothpaste I used, then turned to the camera. Can you hear us? The rain isn't too much. His cameraman clarified that they were fine. The rain was steady and appeared to even have let up a little. My head was spinning from how quickly everything was happening. I stepped back, attempting to regain some personal space, but dude advanced on me, herding me back to him with the microphone as if it were a cattle prod. Don't move. We have to be like this for the shot to be framed correctly. He snapped back to the camera, waited three beats, and started in with no further instruction. This is the dude at the Cactus Cup, and I've been able to wrangle an interview with one of the most contentious and possibly hated people in archery right now. Die from the Westmount Center. Hated? I mewed in shock, but he continued talking into the microphone. Die might not be recognizable since she's so new to our sport, but her sexist agenda has already rocked the industry with the creation of the Advancement for Female Archers, or, as many are calling it, the Advancement of Feminist Agenda where she is convincing otherwise intelligent companies to punish the bread and butter of this industry, the men, by pulling all the money from them and giving it to any woman who wanders by. Adrenaline had my heart beating like a drum on overdrive, but I was finally able to cut in on him. None of that is true at all. No money has been taken from any male prize purse or contract. Nothing you are saying is factually correct. He turned on me. Didn't this all happen because you are sleeping with one of the odors of Westmound? He jammed the microphone in my face. My relationship with Liam is hardly any of your business. This is a disgusting interview that is going to do nothing but get everyone upset. The least of whom was me. I knew that I was just seconds from bursting into tears myself. The money used from AFA comes from marketing dollars and is aimed at improving growth in the entire industry. More money coming in will benefit everyone. From companies down to individual archers, if you want to have an honest interview with us, you can talk to Orion. I stepped away. There was no point in continuing anything with him. When I was only a few feet away, he grabbed my arm, his fingers digging into my flesh. I yelped and whipped around. Fear reared in my chest, but before I could say anything, Moo knocked into him, barking loudly. There was a snarling in his bark that I had never heard before. Dude dropped my arm and hopped back several steps. Moo stayed pressed against me, the hair on his back sticking straight up. He kept growling. That dog tried to bite me, dude shouted. Out of nowhere, Unk swooped in between us. He did no such thing. You grabbed her, and if that dog hadn't done something, I would have. And it wouldn't have been so loud or so harmless. Dude growled and started to storm off, only to trip over my backpack on the ground. Get your stupid backpack out of here. He kicked it several feet away before storming off. I should have chewed him out for that alone, but I was stunned into silence. I realized that everyone was staring. I had no idea when Ankh had come over, but I had a sense that everyone within a hundred yards had seen the interview and maybe heard it as well. My face burned. Did everyone think the way Dude did? That I was some interloper trying to ruin the sport? That I was sleeping with Liam to get my way? Was I really hated? When I looked up, Dude and his cameraman were gone, and Mary was thanking Unk. She seemed as rattled as I felt. Thank you. I can't believe he did that. We don't even know him. She turned to me. Are you okay? Yeah, I said, 
though I didn't mean it. I wanted to escape, to run. Moose seems pretty upset. I should take him for a walk. What? Right now? No, let me go get Liam to go with you. I'll be right back. She jogged off. Everyone else was hanging back. I imagined they were embarrassed for me, though perhaps they really agreed with Dude. No one had really spoken to me that morning. I had assumed that they were, like me, focused on practicing. But could they have been purposely avoiding me? Angry at me? I turned to Unc, a surprising and sudden ally. At least he didn't think I deserved the ambush. Uh, Tell Mary that I took the little path off the side of the parking lot. And I jogged off, a tear already sliding down my face. I didn't stop jogging until I was far enough away that I was sure no one could see me. Then I started crying in big, shuddering breaths. The rain was steady, but I didn't bother to pull my hood up over my head, instead letting the rain mingle with my tears. I had been so excited for this project. A chance to give back in a meaningful way that could potentially benefit female archers, but also the entire industry through growth. Had I been naive? Elizabeth Anderson had thought it was a good idea, as had Orion, and Mary, and Liam. Maybe we were all wrong? The path I was on crossed the road that ran through the enormous open acreage facility, then turned and ran parallel to it. I noticed a few cars returning to the parking lot. I wondered if Jess would be returning with lunch, then realized she had been planning to text to ask what we wanted. I patted my pocket, only to remember that I had left my phone in my backpack. It was probably broken from dude kicking it. And immediately, hot shame twisted my heart at the thought of the encounter. I followed the path as it ran up next to the culvert. It had been empty when we drove out this morning, but now was full almost to the brim with dirty brown racing water that carried all kinds of debris. I pulled Moo away because the swift water was pulling rocks from the riverbed and eroding the bank even as I watched. I heard my name being called, and when I turned, I could see that Liam was jogging up the path from quite a distance. I had wanted a bit more time to gather myself, but equally, I wanted to just collapse into his arms. I turned back to the water and took a few deep breaths to gather myself and decided what I wanted to tell him first. Moo barked, and I already knew what had caught his eye. About a hundred yards down, I could see a shape on the opposite side of the bank. It was a crumpled up L in neon yellow. Perhaps from a sign? Around it was lumpy beige material. My eyes ran over the shape a few times as I stepped down the path to get closer. I kept trying to find something familiar in the shapes. The L seemed rounded. Maybe a crushed bend of a pipe? Was that a mop next to it? Suddenly, everything snapped into place and I recognized it. I wheeled back and ran into Liam's chest. What's wrong? Mary said there was an incident. But all was forgotten as I choked back a sob. You need to call 911. There's a body in the river and I think it's Candy. Chapter 8 I held Liam with one hand and rested the other on Moose Collar. We walked back to the range as the emergency helicopter took off from the desert floor, circled around us, then headed back to town. I hadn't been able to see everything from where we stood, but I had observed enough to know that it had indeed been candy I had seen and that the emergency workers were conducting a recovery rather than a rescue operation. After Liam had placed a call, the helicopter had landed and its crew had started to assess the situation. We had assumed an officer would come over to talk to us, but no one had ever appeared. Then the helicopter took off. I knew that I needed to share that it was quite possible that Candy's situation was not an accident, as they had assumed. But I waited, wanting to check on Mary first and make sure she was safe. As we got to the parking lot, Mary was already running up to us, as Unc, still stuck to her side, followed. When I saw the helicopter fly overhead, I about had a cow. I thought... She threw her arms around my neck. It was Candy. Is she okay? Mary covered her mouth with a hand. I shook my head and we all stood in silence for a moment. Wait, are you saying Candy is dead? Unc interjected. What happened? Mary and I exchanged a quick look. And with a few subtle eyebrow raises and tiny head jerks, Mary and I agreed not to let him in on the investigation. Virtually everyone was a suspect. I turned to him to explain what would become common knowledge within a few minutes. It looks like she slipped into this... I really don't know what it was, 
Remember the dry gully that we had to drive down through this morning because of the detour? It ran next to the road back that way? I gestured behind me, unsure of what to say, since I wasn't even sure what Candy had fallen into. Unk nodded. The flash flood? They just made an announcement a few minutes ago. The rain coming off the mountains combined with the rain we got and it came out of nowhere. We're cut off from the main highway because the flood took out the bridge and the detour. They're trying to open up a back road out of here, but the secondary road crosses some shooting ranges, so they need to do a whole safety protocol shutdown. Liam put a hand on my back. That explains why no one came to talk to us. I need to talk to the tournament director. Do you want to come? I shook my head. Not really. I kind of need to talk to Mary. He gave me a hug and a kiss on the cheek before he whispered in my ear, I'll be back soon. Keep Moo with you. I nodded and realized that Unk had already said goodbye to Mary and left, probably eager to share the shocking news. Mary dragged me over to a small bench that was mostly shielded by a large flowering bush. I was wet enough that I didn't care. I made Moo sit down and took the time to thoroughly scratch him all over as he stared lovingly into my eyes. Is Liam going to destroy Dude? Mary asked. Oh man, I forgot to tell him about that. Even thinking about it made my stomach roll over a few times. Mary read that in my face. Hey, don't let them get to you. I mean, I am not surprised that someone feels that AFA is a bad idea, but most people are excited. And you did a great job defending it. You were clear, professional, and to the point. I blew out a sigh. I felt like I was a hysterical maniac. You weren't. And that was so weird. This is archery, not some gossipy trash show. I doubt he'll air that at all. He was such a jerk. Most people wouldn't stand for it. They prefer their archery news to be respectful and maybe even a little bit boring. I knew Mary was biased, being my closest friend and having worked on every step of the AFA program right by my side. I wasn't sure I believed her, but I couldn't help but feel a little better. Though I really wanted to continue on the topic of how not everyone hated me, there were far more important matters. Mary, we should call Cold. Tell him about Candy. I don't have his number, do you? I shook my head. Surely someone does. Could it have been an accident? Just a horrible, unfortunate accident? Whatever she fought with Cold about, she ran off, maybe got too close to the edge of the bank, or was even walking down in the gully when the flood hit and got knocked out? Just the thought of it made my heart pound. Hopefully she never knew what happened. Or maybe someone followed her and hit her on the head and pushed her in? They hoped her body would go farther downstream? At least Cold can't be blamed. He had already left. Did you see anyone head in that direction? I was taking care of Moo and our equipment, and I didn't even look that way. I didn't see anyone specifically go that way, but a lot of people were running around, either leaving or just sticking stuff in their cars to stay dry. Anyone could have followed Candy and come back unnoticed, Mary said. It just doesn't seem like it could have been an accident. That is just too much of a coincidence. I looked up to see Unk heading toward us as he balanced several silver-wrapped items and a few bottled waters. Hi, Unk, I called out when he stopped and waited to be noticed. Mary scooted closer to me and gestured to the space on her other side. Want to join us? He barely even noticed me, though he did hand me one of the wrapped items before sitting next to Mary and turning his full attention on her. I grabbed you some food. That line was crazy long behind me. Thank you. I'm starving. I had to pull Moo back to me as I recognized his food-stealing gaze on Unk's burger. Moo had a special talent for picking out the most distracted eater. Unk was so focused on Mary that he had left an unwrapped burger on his lap without a protective hand to shield it from Moo. When I dragged Moo to my far side, he moaned dramatically and lay down on the desert gravel, which was already mostly dry. They went through a complicated exchange of napkins and condiments, each commenting on their dislike of too much mayonnaise on their burgers and a shared love of double ketchup. I was able to snag a few packets off Mary's knee and wondered if Mary felt that much of a third wheel when I was with Liam and she was stuck trying to wrestle a tempered water bottle from people who were too wrapped up in each other to notice. I finally managed to put my burger together while balancing everything in my lap. I bit into it and a huge splotch of mustard, mayo, and ketchup mixture landed on my chest. 
I tried to ask for a napkin, but Unc and Mary were pretty busy discussing the various benefits of their opposing stabilizer sponsors. Finally, I just put my burger down and snatched the napkin from Mary's lap. I cleaned myself up as best I could, then noticed the empty foil wrapper on my lap. I turned to Moo, who was innocently sitting there next to me. He was perfectly still and seemed the picture of innocence, except for a large piece of lettuce hanging out of his mouth. I sighed and had to admit that he had won that burger fair and square, and I sent up a prayer that I could grab more food later. Eventually, the conversation slowed between Mary and Unc as they finished up their meal and sat munching on the fries that no one had bothered to offer me. Then Unc caught sight of me and seemed to remember with a start that I even existed. You need a napkin? he offered. No, thank you, I countered. Mary looked all around. So weird. I thought I had one. Can I have that? I remembered that Logan had said that Unc was somehow involved with the incident with cold the previous season. I needed to figure out how to broach the subject without being too heavy-handed. Unc leaned around Mary to address me fully for the first time. Man, that was crazy with dude. Yeah, it was. I mean, I guess things happen from time to time. I lifted my voice in question, hoping he would agree. Totally. I guess that guy has quite a temper. I assume you already pissed him off in the past. Actually, that was the first time I met him. Have you heard of him acting like that before? Well, last year at the 3D tournament, there was a big showdown with Cold and Candy. He seemed to remember about Candy and shut up. I gave Mary a slight nudge in her side. Based on everything I had seen so far, Unc would tell her anything. But Mary didn't say anything, instead staring at him and smiling. I nudged her two more times before she swung around to face me. What? I resisted the urge to roll my eyes. Instead, I leaned close to her ear. Ask him about the incident. Her mouth went into a small O shape as she registered what I said. She turned back to Unc. Um, what happened with Cold and Candy? I worried that he might try to brush it off, but luckily he was eager to gossip about the event. Or rather, share all the industry news with Mary. Dude was already trying to step into the archery event coverage while still shooting. The camera guy was following his group, which I was in. Dude would shoot, then kind of talk to the camera like he was in an episode of The Office or a documentary. It was a real hassle, but people were trying to be cool about it. We were behind the lead group that Cold was following. They were behind a really slow group, so we kept getting backed up and ended up waiting at the same target. It was a real mess. Oh, totally, Mary said. When she didn't egg on the conversation, I leaned around her. What happened? Unc tore his eyes off Mary. With what? I didn't grind my teeth or roll my eyes at either of them, but it was like trying to pull teeth to get the story out. He wasn't even trying to be evasive. I was thrilled that Mary seemed so genuinely smitten with someone, since Orion told her that he was dating someone else, but I had a murder to investigate. You said it was a mess? How so? Just stuff, he smiled at Mary. Moo stood up and stepped over close before barking once, extremely loudly in Unk's face. Mary and Unk jumped about a mile high, and Unk had to grab the bench to keep from falling over. I pulled Moo closer and scratched behind his ear. Good boy, I whispered. The indirect route wasn't working, so I figured I might as well ask straight out and see what happened. Sorry about that. Moo gets excited sometimes. We had heard that there was some big incident with stuff getting caught on camera and archers being blackmailed. Unk had mostly regained his composure and seemed to be less lost in a misty cloud of puppy love. Oh yeah, I didn't even think of that. I don't know why everyone is freaking out about that. Woodchuck will be fine. He loses his temper every few years at the range, tosses his bow down a bit too hard and shouts. Everyone knows it. Sure, this time he got caught on camera, but he will do his normal apology tour and be fine. Who knows? He might even pick up some new sponsors. Cole is a real jack wagon for trying to blackmail him over it. And Steve, the DOS over there, was the judge. Like, what was he supposed to do about it? Sure, he shouted a bit and lost his cool, but it wasn't like he's paid all that well to be there. It's practically a volunteer position. Steve, the guy that is running this tournament? I thought of his confrontation with Cold earlier. That's him. 
He also does some judging for 3D. His family is out that way. In general, they don't do much, but I guess after Woodchuck's breakdown or blow up, whatever you want to call it, he got called over and he got into it with Woodchuck. I don't know. Some people think it's a bigger deal than I thought it was. I nodded and mentally added Steve to the list of suspects. Could the canceling of the media credential have had more to do with trying to keep Cold away from the event? You said that you weren't even thinking about that. What were you thinking about when you said that the groups backing up at the Target were a real mess? Cold and Dude got into it. Not too surprising. There isn't too much space when you're waiting to shoot, and each was trying to run their own private film shoot. Pretty comical to me. I kind of hung back out of the way with Beans and Frank. We didn't want to get all mixed up in it. It's hard enough to stay focused and in the zone on a normal day without people throwing down. First the blow up with Stephen Woodchuck, then Dude and Cold. How did you shoot? Mary asked, once again getting distracted. Made it into the shoot off and finished second overall, he beamed back at her. What happened with Dude and Cole? I attempted to glean a bit more information, and fast, because I saw a guy coming over. I was pretty sure he was looking for Unk. Just lots of passive-aggressive remarks until finally they blew up. Luckily, it was pretty much at the end of the day. Cold had the official media contract and basically forced Dude to leave. Dude made some remarks about taking everything that Cold had, or was taking, or would take, something like that. Everything he valued, or maybe it was everything that Cold had taken from others he would take. I don't know. I was on a good run and just wanted everyone to shut their pie hole. Hey, I'm going to help this guy, I said I would earlier. Looking forward to tonight, Mary. He got up and left with his friend. So, feeling a little different about Unk? I asked Mary. What? Huh? No, I guess. Wait, what do you mean? A blush crept up her face. I put on a voice to tease her a little in my best impression of a discompopulated Mary. What? Me? Totally in puppy love with a dude that I said I wasn't interested in? We both laughed a little before I continued. Feeling a little differently, huh? I guess so. He's just so nice to stick up for you. He didn't have to. Everyone else was just standing around and I was in shock as much as you were. Then after you left, he was the only one to realize Liam might want to know and he hung out with me afterwards. In Vegas, he was all smooth and cocky. This time he seemed more real and nice. Mary turned to stare back at the range where Unk was visible talking with a group of shooters. He does seem nice. Tonight should be fun. I didn't want to ask about Orion, whom I knew she had still been thinking about. But if he was going to pass up the awesomeness that was Mary, then she should be open to other opportunities. Unk seemed pretty sweet on her, and nice, but maybe I would just check around in case. Moo stood up and smacked me repeatedly in the arm with his tail. Suddenly, Liam was right there. Why didn't you tell me that dude verbally attacked you? Are you okay? Chapter 9 All of the emotions aroused by the interview came rushing back. Embarrassment and hot shame rolled around in my belly. Was there anything worse than the feeling that everyone hated you? Possibly the sensation that you were totally wrong. I stood up and Liam wrapped me in a hug, squeezing me tight. Once I found candy, I forgot, but Liam, it was so terrible. He stroked my back. Hey, it's okay. I'll go kill him for you. I pulled back a little and looked up into his eyes. That's not very funny. I wasn't trying to be. Someone said that he was saying all kinds of awful things, that everyone hates you. It was all about AFA, that I was stealing money from the men and everyone thought I was sleeping my way to the top and something about a feminist agenda. Liam grumbled some choice descriptions of dude and it made me smile a little while also making me check that no one was within earshot. Liam clenched his fist against my back. I never trusted that guy. He came to us with this wild, overinflated budget to get us to sponsor him. When we turned him down, he got pretty worked up about it. I had no idea that he would try to take it out on you, though. You know that none of that is true, right? I mean, I didn't know if any of it was true or false. I had been so sure that AFA was a great idea that I had never questioned it. Then suddenly, I was questioning all of it. I was getting whiplash on top of everything else. Liam grabbed me by the arms and looked into my eyes. No one hates you. Some people are probably mad, but they will always be. 
You could give every archer 100 bucks, and someone would be mad it wasn't more. And even if people have an issue with AFA, that's not your fault. It wasn't like you created AFA by yourself. They can be mad at me or Ryan or even my mom, since she is the one who made the final decision on how the Westmand Anderson budget is spent. We spend the money how we think it'll benefit us best, and you are not responsible for that. Got it? I held back tears. Are you sure? He pulled me in close again. I know you have really worked hard on this, but you aren't in this alone. It's the whole company. You sure you don't want me to go beat up, dude? That's not very professional of you, I murmured into his chest with a smile. I wouldn't be doing it as an archery industry professional. I'd be doing it as your overprotective boyfriend. Thank you for offering, but the answer is still no. He's a jerk, and I don't want you to get kicked off the range for fighting. Moo almost bit him. Good job, Moo. Liam's phone rang and he checked to see who it was. This is Orion. I wanted to update him on the situation. You good? Yeah, we can catch up later. He answered the phone and asked Orion to hold. Thanks, babe. And Moo, you bite anyone's face off if they cross die. He gave me a quick kiss on the forehead before jogging to the parking lot. Mary turned to me. You guys are so cheesy. I watched Liam strong back as he walked away. He radiated confidence. Maybe I should have let him go all alpha male on dude. Was it just my own insecurities that made me feel uncomfortable with the idea? That I didn't deserve Liam and therefore it would be asking too much of him to let him defend me? Or maybe I was a strong independent woman who wanted a partner who supported me while also letting me take the lead on how to handle a confrontation that I had been a part of. Had I really emotionally dealt with the fallout of my divorce or was I carrying too much baggage into a new relationship? My stomach seized up at the idea that I could damage things between us, but I pressed down the rising panic. Liam was awesome. I wasn't so bad, and we could figure it out. I would make sure of it. I resisted the urge to tease Mary about mooning over Unc. I didn't think she was quite ready for that, so I changed the conversation. I think we should go to Steve and Woodchuck, get their opinion on the situation. Chapter 10 my stomach growled as we wove our way past the recurve bows. I bent down to my backpack, which someone had put up on a chair after Dude kicked it. I pulled out a little baggie of trail mix, though it was missing all the candy that made trail mix tasty. I knew all the research on sugar, but couldn't I have a little chocolate? It was a mood stabilizer, and wasn't dark chocolate practically healthy? Chocolate grew on a bush, so it was practically a fruit. I would need to talk to Jess about that. Mary and I scanned the crowd, but Mary spotted Steve first. She touched my elbow and gently guided me toward him. But before I could greet him, he spotted me and came over with his own questions. You're the guy that called in Candy's accident, right? I took a second to gather up my thoughts and attempted to refocus on the investigation at hand. A better opening to talk to Steve wasn't going to fall into my lap again if I botched this one. Yes, that's me. Good. The police called over. The number you gave them was wrong, and the number you called from wasn't answering. They wanted me to find you and ask you to stay here until they can get someone to speak to you. I nodded, but before I could think of a segue, Steve rolled on, and I realized how shaken up he was. Not that you could leave even if you wanted to. He blew out a sigh as he mopped his forehead with a handkerchief. He was sweating despite the temperature still being cool after the rain. Can you tell me what happened? There was the opening I had been hoping for. I took Moo on a walk, and when I came up to the little river thingy, the flash flood, yeah, we warned everyone. There was a handout in the welcome packet, and we made several announcements. She should have known to stay away. I don't understand how this could have happened. I certainly hadn't read my welcome packet, and all the announcements were a garbled mess, but it wasn't the time to mention that. I caught Mary's eye, and she nodded, having noticed the same thing I had. I could lie a little and attack this head-on. They don't think it was an accident. They think it was a murder. I watched his face turn red, and he flopped into an empty folding chair. I sat opposite him. Are you okay? I just... I can't believe... I waited until his color turned a bit more normal before I continued. I just can't believe it. Why would someone want to kill her? Something passed over his face. I mean, that can't really be a surprise. They were playing a dangerous game. 
I had to tread carefully. I tipped my head to the side to look innocent, but knowledgeable enough that he would feel safe confiding in me, a total stranger. Moo sat up from where he had been lying. Even sitting, his head was almost as high as my own, and he copied my tilt. Oh, really? I heard some stuff, but someone told me it was all a misunderstanding. Steve didn't respond, so I pushed a bit harder. That most of the stuff I was hearing about Candy was just gossip. Gossip? You've got to be kidding. I don't think people knew half the sh- stuff they were doing. Threatening people, trying to use footage they had and edit it so it looked worse than it was. Just terrible things. I hoped my high school drama training would hold up as I strove for the perfect mixture of suspicion and willingness to be won over to his point if he tried hard enough. Oh, surely they weren't that bad. Even more so. I mean, Candy didn't even pretend to mourn her poor murdered husband. Just moved right on to Cole, which made sense because they were messing around for years behind her husband's back. Then they have the nerve to act all high and mighty around other people. I mean... He looked around and seemed to be debating. I tried to radiate the energy of a good therapist. I was trustworthy. He wanted to share with me. I could see the exact moment that he decided he had to share. I was a judge at that tournament in Georgia. The 3D one? There was an incident on the range that I was involved in. I handled it completely professionally. These things happen. But Cole and Candy re-edited it so I looked like I was... Ugh. He made a noise of complete frustration, and his fists were balled up so the knuckles were white. He struggled for a few seconds to get the words out. I told him that if he released it, I would sue him for every penny he had, would ever have, or ever had had. In that moment, I could totally believe he could have killed Candy, or Cold, or both of them. Perhaps he made the same connection, because he stood up so suddenly that one second I was looking him in the face, and the next I was looking at his rapidly receding rear pocket. He mopped his face again and shouted over his shoulder back at me, uh, anyways, just stay around until the police arrive. I have to go to work. I turned to Mary, leaning in so our voices wouldn't carry. That was pretty weird. And totally different from what Unc told us about the event. I nodded. Steve made it sound like he was totally innocent and being framed. Unc thought it was a lot more like bad behavior caught on tape. What do you think? Why would Unc lie? He has nothing to gain or lose. And why would Steve be so mad if none of it was true? Imagine someone said you cheated at archery. Would you get mad? She thought it over. Okay, I get your point. I would be pretty pissed. But that is even more reason for him to be a suspect, not less. Even if he did sue and got his name clear, that would be super expensive and some people would forever look sideways. I nodded along, scanning the compound archer side of the field for Woodchuck, the last person we needed to interview, at least for the moment. Hopefully we would have more ideas after talking to him. It had been useful to talk to Steve, but I wasn't sure we had learned much at all. Finally, I spotted Woodchuck. He was talking to Unk. Unk noticed about the same moment and waved us over. Or at least I thought he did. I looked around first to check. Why would he want us to come over? Mary, is Unc waving to us? She waved back and held up a finger to indicate one moment. That is so sweet. He wants to help us out. Help us out? Did you tell him what we were doing? Well, her face went a bit red. He had heard about us. Remember, he was there in Vegas, and he would have had to be an idiot not to notice what happened. And he probably put two and two together after you asked what happened at the 3D tournament last year. Probably? And somehow he knew that we would want to talk to Woodchuck? Okay, so when you were talking to Steve, I texted Unc and said if he saw Woodchuck, we wanted to ask a question. Mary, I blew out a sigh. What? He doesn't know why. Mary, come on, you're not dumb. You know he knows why. Fine, I do, but he isn't a suspect and you always tell Liam stuff. I ground my teeth a little. I wanted to say that Liam was an unk, and we didn't know whether he was trustworthy. But then I realized that saying that would make me sound like I didn't trust her taste, or, even worse, that I didn't trust her. Our friendship was important, and blowing up on her would be the worst thing. Just be careful, Mary. 
She seemed to understand what I was saying more than just that. It'll be fine. And don't worry, I won't be alone with him. I trust him, but technically he is still a suspect. I was relieved that she hadn't lost sight of that fact and jerked my head over toward Unk. Come on, let's not waste this chance. We might not get another. When they open the back road, everyone is going to leave and we need to focus tomorrow. We walked over, dodging around piles of bow cases and cast off equipment. It was kind of ridiculous that people left thousands of dollars worth of equipment lying around, but I had never heard of anything being stolen. Unk saw us approaching and smiled widely, though I noticed that it was mostly directed at Mary, and she blossomed under the attention. Unk was pretty smooth, turning to Woodchuck. Hey, have you met Di and Mary before? They work up at that Westmount Center in Wyoming. Woodchuck shifted his attention to us. Nice to meet you both. I'm Woodchuck. He held out his hand to greet us each in turn. He held my hand a beat too long and gave me a wink, like he had done earlier. But the smile in his eyes seemed to promise that he didn't mean anything serious by it. You were there when Cold pitched his little fit earlier, weren't you? I heard that Candy got hurt and you found her. I saw you at Vegas as well. You have quite the knack for showing up and seeing drama. He managed to infuse a teasing tone into the statement so that it felt as flirty as if he were complimenting my body. Apparently, it was the day for wannabe playboys at the archery range. But he raised a valid point. Anyone who was paying attention would notice that we are mixed up in all the murders. Maybe one day I would need to consider taking up bowling instead. Get a fresh start. I figured it was a good idea to flip the script. Nice to meet you, Woodchuck. You were also there when Cold and Steve got into it, both this time and last year at the 3D. His eyebrow shut up. So you heard about that as well. You really are a top-notch investigator. Yeah, I was there. That's part of the reason I gave Cold a hard time today. I'm not the kind of guy to blame anyone else for my shooting, but Cold and Duke bickering for a half dozen targets wasn't the best for my mood. What happened? You're the little sleuth. You figure it out. He sat down and kicked out his feet to cross his ankles, his arms also crossed. He gave me a smile. You trying to ask me if I was mad enough to kill Candy? The answer is no. If he was going to play hardball, I could return his serves all day, or at least until I got bored, which would definitely come first. Why do you think she was killed? Because everyone is talking about her being murdered. She burned a bunch of bridges and was actively torching her life hooking up with cold. Talk about a sinking ship. How so? How wasn't he? He was high half the time, sending out these insane 2 a.m. emails that sounded like the ravings of a madman threatening to expose us all. Were you scared of being exposed? Exposed as what? The bad boy of archery? Please, I wish he had. Sure, some people would be mad, claim that I should get my sponsorships pulled, but I did what most of them couldn't do. I shot winning scores, and I entertain. This sport is boring and stale. I'm at least interesting. I had nothing to fear. Do I shout and scream sometimes? Yeah. But am I passionate about the sport of my performance? Even more so. I'm passionate about a lot of things. He raised an eyebrow at me, and I didn't want to contemplate the implications of his comment. To avoid any more of his intense eye contact, I took the chance to look around and noticed a bright yellow sports car pulling into the parking lot. I was so caught off guard that I didn't even notice I was speaking until I heard my own voice squeak. Is that cold? Chapter 11 I jogged over to the parking lot, dodging around people. The road must have opened back up. A few more cars were pulling into parking spots. I banged on Cold's window as he rummaged around in a bag. He jumped and jerked around before rolling down the window. What do you want? He growled, turning his back on me to dig around some more. He pulled out some little baggies and stuffed them into the hoodie he was wearing. I'm just glad you're okay. I have some bad news. I turned as Mary skidded up next to me. Suddenly, I was shy and nervous. I was glad that Cold was okay, though it had never been much of a concern since he had driven off safely long before the flash flood. But I hadn't really thought about what I was going to tell him about Candy when he got back. I exchanged a look with Mary, who gave me a tight smile. She wasn't enjoying the idea of telling Cold either, unless that expression meant that the hamburger she had eaten was starting to turn. Cold, has anyone called you about candy? 
I asked, attempting to ease into the topic. What? No, I think we're done. He grumbled some unflattering words about her as he dug through her bag. I squatted and rested my arms on the side of the car. Cold, I need you to look at me. I waited until his attention was on me. His eyes were bloodshot, and I noticed how sick he was. The drug use must be excessive. After you left, I was out walking, and... Candy is dead. He stared at me for so long that I feared he hadn't heard me at first. Then I realized he was in shock as his face drained to blood. He swallowed hard. What happened to her? I don't know. I saw a body face down in the river that formed from the flash flood, and I called the police. They are investigating it as a homicide. I'm so sorry, Cold. The police should be here soon to interview me. You need to talk to them about everything that has been going on. In a daze, he opened his car door, knocking me to the ground in the process. Mary helped me up as Moo licked my face. Cold didn't seem to notice, instead closing and locking the car door and looking around aimlessly. The police, of course. I need that folder I gave you. They'll want to see this. I can't believe it. Candy. He stumbled toward the tent in which he had spoken to me only a few hours earlier. So much had changed so quickly. He shivered a little in his sweatshirt, which was dark from the rain. I followed, unsure of what to say. He was having a perfectly normal reaction to hearing that his partner was dead, but I still felt out of my depth. Had I become too complacent about murder? Was I losing my humanity? I'm sorry, Cold, I said as I reached my backpack. I unzipped it and dug around inside, but immediately my heart sank. The envelope was missing. I moved things around, thinking that maybe it could have slipped to the bottom, but the large manila folder was gone. Um, it's gone. Cold seemed to wake up a little. You lost it? No, someone must have stolen it. Did you tell anyone about it? No one. Candy didn't either. I told her it was important that no one knew. I saw you guys fighting before you left. Maybe that is related? I asked. He had been looking around, but he swung back fast with a glare that sent ice through my veins and had me reeling back. With clenched teeth, he glared at me. That was none of your business. Moo pressed between us, the hairs on his back raising and a growl vibrating under my fingers. I didn't blame Moo. Cold had gone from normal to maniac in a split second. I held up the hand that wasn't on Moo. Fine. There was an awkward silence for a minute. Finally, Cold let out a sigh, and all the anger drained from his face. I need a smoke. I'm going out past the porta potties in the far end of the parking lot. Otherwise, people will complain. Bunch of whiners. Don't go anywhere. I need you to explain to the police about the note, at the least. The rest of the emails I can print off again. He stomped off, and I held my breath until he ducked behind a tent and was out of sight. I turned to Mary, still feeling a bit shaky as I flopped into the chair. I don't know if I handled that well. She sat opposite me. I think you did great. I dug around in my bag for my phone, finally finding it at the bottom. I peeled off some squares of paper that were stuck to it. I didn't want to litter, so I dropped them back into my backpack to clean up later. The screen appeared to be cracked, but after closer inspection, I let out a sigh. It was just the screen protector. Ugh, dude owes me three bucks for a new protector. He is such a jerk, said a voice behind me. I turned around and recognized Batter, a compound archer I had met at Vegas a few months earlier. I believed her nickname was related to her job at a bakery. I hopped up to hug her and gestured to the chair opposite me. Batter, how's it going? Good, good. Hey, I wanted to talk to you about AFA. It's still going to happen, right? Dude didn't ruin anything, did he? It's a great idea, and he's just... I mean, this is a big deal, and I'm kind of counting on it. All the words came rushing out like a waterfall, and she was flushed by the end of her short speech. She swallowed hard and started in again before I could fully process what she had said. This has just been a really rough day. The stupid airlines opened my bow case at security, and now it isn't shooting right. Plus, all the flights were delayed by three hours, so now I don't have enough time to practice and fix it. Then I tried to leave the range to eat after lunch, but the flash flood ruined the road that you leave on. 
Then they said that even when the roads reopened, we need to leave a different way. So we had to come back here and wait. We get back here and I hear the dude went in hard on you and then AFO might be canceled. Please don't cancel it. I just went from full time to part time at my job to train more. But if you guys pull the money, then I can't afford to do that, even if I win every tournament. She was holding herself together pretty well, but her eyes were getting a little red and shiny and I could sense that she was moments from losing it. I spotted Liam looking around the crowd and I stood briefly and waved him over. I also pulled up all the information he had given me. It's okay, Batter. Dude's getting intense in his interview with me will make no difference. Moo stood up and went to her, pressing into her side. He must have known she was a dog person because I could see the tension around her eyes lessen as she shifted her attention to Moo, telling him what a smart and handsome dog he was. That gave me a second to stand and hug Liam while whispering in his ear, she's worried that dude's criticism will lead to AFA being canceled. He hugged me back and grabbed a chair to join us. Everything that we ever released, we stand behind. I spoke with Orion and he hadn't heard any formal complaints. If dude wants to discuss it again in the future, Orion will handle it himself. Batter let out a long, shuddering breath. That is such a relief. Alpha is the best thing I have seen in archery, and it just felt so unfair that we could lose it. But I should have known that Westmount Anderson wouldn't give in to a snake-like dude. This is going to be a good thing. I just know it. A blush rose in her cheeks as she stood up. Sorry to dump all that on you. I stood and joined her for a second, something niggling at the back of my brain. You're fine. Trust me. I had a similar reaction. I followed her a few steps. After an incident in Vegas, which she had given me some inside gossip, I had a question for her. Once we were a few steps away, I leaned in. Do you know anything about Unk? Like what? Oh, is he a nice guy? A player? Her mouth went round and she looked over my shoulder at Mary, then nodded. He's a flirt, but seems like a nice enough guy. I hear that he likes... She jerked her head back to Mary. I nodded. So it seems... And one more thing? Yes? I tried to think. She had said something earlier that had piqued my interest, but I had to remember what it was. Then it hit me. Did you say that the roads are still closed? She groaned and rolled her eyes. Yes, we sat out there forever. This douche wagon behind us in a yellow, like, Mustang or Corvette or whatever, kept honking like the only thing that was preventing us from leaving was that we forgot to move or something. Yellow sports car? Like that one? Could it have been cold behind you? I pointed at the bright yellow car, the only one that color in the parking lot other than two large SUVs that couldn't have possibly been confused for cold's flashy rental. It could have been cold, and that does seem like the kind of thing he would have done. Hold on. She held up a hand behind her ear and positioned herself to face one of the large field speakers, which had crackled to life. A second later, Steve's voice came through. Attention! I was just informed that the alternate exit from the range has been opened, and you can now leave. Exit the parking lot and turn left. Signs have been put up, and you can follow them back to the highway. Please drive safely. Batter started to edge away from me. Thanks for everything, Di. We should definitely catch up more, but I need to get out of here. I mumbled my goodbye to her and went back to flop into my seat next to Liam and Mary. Liam held out a hand for Moo's leash. If you're okay, why don't I take him for a walk? Sure, great, thanks. I gave him a grateful smile, but my mind was already on other things. After he left, I turned to Mary. I needed to figure things out, but before I could have done more than open my mouth, my phone rang. I saw that it was Jess. Hey, what's going on? I'm so sorry we took so long getting all dried off and cleaned up but we're about to grab some food and come back to the range. Jess was shouting into the phone as Minx and Tiger argued in the background, debating between dining in and heading back for more practice. You guys weren't caught in the flash flood? I asked. Another piece of the puzzle had just been flipped over, but I wasn't sure what it meant. What flash flood? Are you okay? The concern was heavy in her voice. It's fine. We're fine. Grab us whatever you want. When you come back here, you're going to have to use a different entrance, but there will be signs. Thanks. Bye. I hung up quickly before she could ask more questions. Everything was being juggled in my brain, and I was scared that if I didn't get it out soon, I would forget. 
Mary looked up. Get us whatever. We already ate. My stomach growled in disagreement, but I ignored it. I grabbed her by both shoulders. Forget about that, because I think I might know who killed Candy. Chapter 12 Mary jumped to her feet and looked around. Who? I chewed on my lip. I think it could be cold. Follow me on this. We saw them have a big fight, and he drove off. Jess and everyone left about ten minutes later, but they didn't have any problem leaving because the flash flood hadn't hit yet. Then sometime after that, Batter left, and Cold ended up behind her, stuck because the flash flood had come. Where was he during that missing time? Mary wrinkled her nose. Killing Candy? Remember this morning how he kept insisting that someone wanted both of them dead and Candy was skeptical? Maybe he was making that up. But the emails were real. I nodded. Yes, and a lot of people told us that folks were mad at him and her. Maybe they fought in the parking lot and he drove away, then suddenly realized it was the perfect cover. He circles back and hunts around until he finds her. By then, the flash flood has occurred. She can't hear him over the noise, and he comes up behind her and shoves her in, thinking he could drive away. It's only after he is stuck behind Batter that he realizes he can't get away. He's mad and starts honking and only comes back because he has no choice. Mary's eyes lit up a little. The pieces were coming together. That makes sense. Maybe he was even waiting for his chance? That death threat was the perfect cover. But why? He's high all the time. Maybe she's become a liability. That snake, he used us. He was hoping that we would run to the police with him and give him a list of suspects. Then who stole the envelope of emails? Hmm, that is a good question. It was proof that they were in danger. Unless some of them were fake to convince us... So he stole them because he knew the police would figure it out, then ask why he faked it. I stared at the ground. I needed to figure it out and fast. With the road open, the police were going to show up. I needed hard evidence, not just my gut. My backpack was still open, and a piece of paper I had pulled off of my phone caught my eye. Then I noticed a few more squares. The two I could see had the letters Y and D on them. I reached into my backpack and pulled them out, then searched around to find two more. One side was part of an image, and the other was the lowercase letters E and A. What are those? Mary asked. I flipped them over so the letters were facing up and arranged them on my leg. I think they were off that note that said, you're dead. They must have fallen off and out of the envelope. Mary shook her head. Death threats aren't made the way they used to be. I flipped over the little squares to better inspect the other side. Obviously, it was a picture of something brightly colored. I flipped around the squares, hoping to recognize the shapes. Mary pulled her chair around to my side to see them from the same angle as me. Are those satin pillows? They have stitching on them and are so round and shiny. Hot air balloons! This is the corner of the basket! That's a heart-shaped hot air balloon. I saw one like it this morning floating in the air. It has to be the same balloons. Look, this is the pants from that yellow Bob Square sponge character, the one I saw this morning. Cole told me that the note arrived by mail a few days ago at his house, and Candy brought the mail, and he was the one that found it. What if he made it from a newspaper at the airport, then stuck it in the mail? This is it! A young man's voice interrupted our conversation as it called my name. Die! Die! I grabbed the papers and pocketed them carefully as Indy approached us. He was cold son. Hey, Indy. I'm so glad I found you. You have to help my dad. Did he tell you that someone wants to hurt him? He left L.A. and drove overnight, then called this morning to say he got a death threat. I had a full-blown panic attack and just decided to change my flight. I have to protect him. Candy has him hooked on all these drugs. She's trying to kill him. Indy was winding himself up again, pacing back and forth, his voice hysterical. I was at a complete loss for words. I didn't think I could broach the suspicion that we thought his dad had killed Candy and had orchestrated the whole death threat thing, but holding back everything wasn't fair either. Indy, I need you to sit down. Something in my voice must have warned him. He went totally white. Is dad okay? I pulled out a chair. It's about Candy. She's dead. He let out a long, shuddering breath and buried his face in his hands. 
His shoulders started shaking, and I realized he was crying. I placed a hand on his back, and he turned toward me to cry on my shoulder. He seemed so young, and really, he was. Only 20-ish. I knew he adored his dad, and I vowed to do whatever I could to help him during this difficult time. He would need our support. Across the field, I saw an increase in activity, and though I wanted to see what it was about, I tried to focus on Indy. Within a minute, he sat up, his face splotchy and red as he scrubbed at it. I'm so relieved. I can help him get clean now. He hasn't done any drugs in a week, and he said he was willing to go to rehab, but only if Candy would go too. I don't want him around her at all. I was too scared to say it, but I thought that Candy was making it all up so she could kill him. I know she was having an affair, and... He stopped speaking and turned around as an ambulance pulled into the parking lot, its siren blaring. We stood up as staff members spotted Indy and waved him over. Indy, it's your dad. He collapsed. Chapter 13 I was trying to keep up with Indy, but it wasn't possible. And when I got to the crowd, I realized that I wouldn't be able to get any closer. Before I could get any information, Indy and Cold were put into an ambulance and driven away. The crowd slowly dispersed. I eavesdropped, but it seemed that no one had any information. They mostly repeated the same thing I already knew, that Cold had been on the ground and not breathing. Someone had found him, but no one seemed to know who. Some thought he was just dead. Others thought he had overdosed. Some thought he had passed out drunk, and a few wondered out loud if he had a bad heart. I chewed on my nail and my gut twisted. Cold had been living a hard life. He had looked just terrible. His decline since I had first met him in December was shocking. Additionally, he was fighting with everyone. It was very likely that drugs had done him in, or maybe he attempted to overdose on purpose out of guilt. But that wasn't the only option. Someone could have tried to kill him, or even succeeded based on how frantically the paramedics had been working. I had gotten separated from Mary, and the crowd was mostly gone. I wandered back to the tents to look for Liam. Finally, I found him and Moo standing with a group of archers in Westmount jerseys. The second he saw me, he said his goodbyes and came over. You okay? Why do you ask? Because both Candy and Cold are dead. Colt's dead? I thought he... The dude who found him doesn't think his chances are very good. He gave him CPR, but he was still unresponsive when the ambulance arrived. He's pretty shaken up about it, but I guess nothing's official yet. Di, are you going to investigate this? I already was. Cold asked me to help this morning. He had a bunch of threatening emails and a letter. I rubbed my arms. I don't feel so good. He took me over to a cluster of chairs. This is not your fault. You know that, right? Moo got up in my face, jabbing his wet nose into my eye. He whined and pawed at me, spreading mud all along my thigh. Normally, I would have pushed him away, but I just felt like mush. I had never failed so badly at an investigation before. Maybe after Cold and Candy were officially dead, I would be able to figure it out, but the whole point had been to prevent them from dying at all. I didn't even have any evidence to show the police except a few bits of newspaper. Liam gave me a hug after pushing Moo away from my face. Hey, have you eaten? You look a little pale. Not really. He kissed my forehead. Stay here and I'll get you some food. I'm not sure what they have, though. Thank you. Whatever you get will be fine. I was lost in thought. I had had a great solution, so why did it suddenly feel so wrong? Mary flopped into a seat opposite me and handed me a paper. Where did you go? Where did you go? I countered, but even I could tell that my voice lacked energy. Look at the cover picture. Hot air balloons. I perked up a little bit and carefully dug into my back pocket to pull out the scraps of paper, but I was already sure they would match when I flipped to the other side and found large letters from an advertisement. Hold this page up. Mary held up the page, the image toward me. I matched up the first little square and gently pressed my finger to a spot. What's on the opposite side of my finger? She poked around until she was pushing up against my finger. Looks like a Y. We repeated the exercise with each of the squares until we confirmed that all the letters had come from the newspaper. I sat back. Great, but we kind of knew this. 
Look at the date on the newspaper. I took it from Mary and looked more closely. This is from Tuesday. That was yesterday. And wasn't cold in L.A. then? I nodded and thought, maybe he came in this morning and made the note with an old local newspaper. I mean, this paper is still lying around, so why not another one? As opposed to making it ahead of time, you think he drove from L.A. at midnight, arrived at the airport to pick up candy, and came straight over here to ask for your help and still had time to make an arts and crafts project? That would explain why it's falling apart, I mumbled, but I wasn't convinced anymore. And frankly, I wanted to believe that it wasn't cold. Indy had been so sure that his dad was in danger. Do you think that cold killed Candy? I don't know, Di. Mary blew out a sigh and scratched behind Moo's ear. It was something both of us did when we had nervous energy to burn. Moo loved it. His eyes rolled back in his head, his tongue lolled out, and his back foot started to thump on the ground. I don't know either. I was sure because all of the pieces matched up. He made this note to make us think they were in danger. Then he stole back the evidence and killed Candy, then coincidentally overdosed. Or even purposely out of guilt. I gave Moo a scratch in his rump and he groaned loudly at all the attention he was getting. I mean, it works. I think my logic is flawless, but... Exactly, but... The weight in my stomach wasn't going away. What if I'm wrong? What if the letter was real? Then likely whoever stole the letter was the one that made it. I stopped scratching Moo. Probably. I'm trying to remember when I last saw all that stuff. I put it away, but didn't notice it was gone until Cold asked for it. If he was just going to overdose on purpose out of guilt, then why even bother to ask? If he stole it, then why point out that it was missing? He looked legit mad at you. Why be so mad if he already knew Candy was dead and the packet of information was gone because he stole it? Maybe he was just mad that Candy was found. Maybe he thought she'd be swept away. It wasn't that the theory was obviously wrong, but something didn't feel right. What if we approach it this way? If it wasn't Cold, who was it? What is going on? You mean if Cold didn't kill Candy or if he didn't write the note? Both. Either. Let's just talk this through. Let's assume that the letter is real. What does that mean? So you mean that Cole didn't write the letter? Then I guess someone else wants them dead or at least wants them to be scared. Maybe they slipped the note in the car and they assumed Cole and Candy thought it came from the mail? I nodded. Okay, that is a point. This is what they told me at the car this morning about the letter. Candy grabbed the mail from the last few days ditched all the envelopes and didn't look through the stuff until Cold picked her up at the airport. That note wasn't folded. It would have to have been sent in a big envelope, and she claimed she didn't notice the giant death threat on it. Good point. I hadn't thought of that. That doesn't sound very likely. Oh, geez. Why didn't I think of this? If it was yesterday's paper, then it has to be a fake. No way it could have been in the mail unless it was sent the same day. He picked her up at the airport, waited for her to put the mail in, slipped it in the rest. Wait. Mary leaved in. What? The airport. He said she came in on the 6 a.m. flight this morning. But didn't Batter say that something about all the flights being delayed? Oh my gosh, she did. Mary pulled out her phone and started pressing away at the keys. After a minute that felt like an hour, she looked up. There was some problem at the airport, and many flights were canceled or at least delayed. No flight came in until 9 a.m. We arrived at the range at like 8, and Cold and Candy showed up within 10 minutes, maybe 15 at most. No way could he have picked her up when he said he did if she flew in like she said. Do you think he was lying? Maybe, but why? What part of his story relied on him lying to me about that? And Indy said he was definitely in Los Angeles until last night. No, I think he picked her up at the airport, just like he said, and she told him that she flew in. Mary picked up where I stopped. She had been here in Phoenix for a while, made up the death threat, then went to the airport and pretended she had just arrived. She had to ditch all the envelopes because the death threat was never in an envelope at all, which leaves two questions. Why was she in Phoenix, and why did she want Cold to think someone wanted him dead? 
I snickered, remembering the way that she glared at him this morning. I think she wanted him dead. It was meant as a joke, but once I said it out loud, it seemed less funny and rather too true to ignore. This morning, she kept glaring at him and insisting that someone only wanted him dead, not her. Maybe she wanted him dead, but wanted to support the idea that it was an unknown stranger. One of the rumors we heard today was that Candy was having an affair. Several different people mentioned it. She and a lover could have planned to get rid of him. Then who killed Candy? Her lover? With Candy dead, her lover stole the evidence of the letter because he knew it was a crappy job and the police would figure out it was faked. Then he killed Cold? I thought Cold collapsed. Was there any evidence that he was attacked? No, but if Candy is behind this, then... I paused to think. Cold had been so sick recently, and I had been assuming it was drugs. But maybe it was more. Do you remember that video I found that Cole had taken back when we thought Candy might have killed her husband? The one where Cole is talking to someone about poison? I kind of forgot about that. Did you ever talk to Brian about it? No, but I think I need to. I pulled out my phone and dialed Brian, an officer who visited the training center back in Wyoming quite often. He had been one of the investigators when Candy's husband had been stabbed at the center. After Brian answered and we traded some information about the weather at our respective locations, I dove into the conversation that I knew would make Brian mad. Hey, this is kind of random, but remember Mac? He was killed at the center? You mean the dude that was stabbed in the neck while I was working security less than six months ago? Yeah, I remember. Kind of hard to forget. Did you ever hear anything about him being poisoned before he was stabbed? There was a long pause. I can't answer that, but if you have any information, I would really like to hear it. Okay, so don't be mad, but I had this memory chip at the center where Cold was talking to someone about poison, and just a few minutes ago, Cold collapsed and his son thinks Candy is trying to kill him. When did you get this memory card? I didn't answer. Finally, he blew out a breath, and when he spoke again, I could imagine him grinding his teeth as he talked. Die? Die? I asked you if you had any information back then. I know, and when you asked, I technically didn't even have the memory card. Moo ate it. But later he threw it up, and I found it. You already had the killer. Stop. I can't get into this right now. Tell me where the card is, and we'll go from there. I sighed, but knew he was right. I would get chewed out later, and I deserved it. I ran through where the memory card was in my office. He wished me luck at the tournament though only briefly, then hung up without a further goodbye. I turned to Mary. So now we just need to find her lover? My stomach growled loudly. And where is Liam with my lunch? Mary grabbed my arm and turned me in the direction she was staring. Oh no, is that him shouting at dude? Moo growled and launched himself to Liam's defense, and I was only a few steps behind. Now that I noticed Liam, I was surprised I hadn't noticed his voice earlier. He wasn't shouting so much as speaking forcefully in a way that carried across the suddenly silent range. Everyone within hearing distance was watching. Conversations had stopped and people's responses varied from listening, but pretending they weren't, to pulling out phones to record. A small knot of archers was forming that looked ready to jump in should things turn physical. Liam held up his hand. Easy now. I think you're getting pretty worked up for no reason. Dude's voice had a hysterical note to it in contrast to Liam's loud but logical tone. No reason. Your little girlfriend sent you over here to confront me. You're going to throw your weight around and ruin me. I came over here to get food. You're the one that's getting up in my face. Liam held up the foil-wrapped hot dogs. Despite speaking loudly, he seemed totally calm and unflappable. That made Dude's shrill shouting even more comical. She's a meddler! Why do you care who I love? Mary grabbed my arm. Did he say he loved you? He did, but my excitement was dampened by how weird the scene was. I agree with Liam. Why did dude care so much? The blowhard interviewer moved forward into Liam's face. She ruined everything. You need to step back and drop this. You weren't going to get the grant whether AFA was formed or not. Suddenly, I realized that dude wasn't hysterical over the AFA. None of it was about that. It was about something far more life and death. 
mostly death. It was a gamble with everyone watching, and I would be a fool if I was wrong, but dude was so worked up that this was the best chance to get him to stumble. He's mad that I was investigating the death threat against cold, I said. Dude whipped around at me. The anger in his face was such that I took an instinctive step back and pulled Moo in front of me. He took a step in my direction. His eyes were bulging out of his head. He held his fists in front of him, ready to take a swing. There is no real death threat against cold. I have a copy of it. I tried to look confident. No, you don't. Prove it. Show it to everyone. I needed to be careful to set the hook. You know I don't, because you stole it from my backpack. When you kicked my backpack and cracked my phone protector, thank you very much, you called it my backpack. You knew it was mine because you had rifled through it earlier to get rid of the evidence. You also knew the threat was fake because you helped Candy make it, didn't you? You said last year that you would take everything that belonged to Cold, and that includes Candy. Something flickered across his face and he was too angry to back up. You're crazy! Whatever, shouted Woodchuck. I don't know about the rest of it, but you and Candy were definitely hooking up. I saw you two Tuesday night at that seed food place, making out in the corner. Just a random hookup, said Dude. You know how Candy was, throwing herself at anyone she thought could benefit her. After we hooked up that once, she said she could work on my show, and I turned her down. Right, Amp? He gestured to his cameraman, who was edging away. I don't want any part of this, he said. Amp, man, don't leave me hanging. You were totally on board with grilling dye. Tell Liam that part. Amp stopped backing up. You weren't to be stopped. You came back from your walk all keyed up and wanted to interview Di about Affa. When you said hard hitting, I didn't think you meant going psycho on her. What walk? I shouted. Do you mean down off that way? I pointed in the direction of where I had found Candy's body. Yeah, Amp replied, but with a bit more hesitation. Perhaps he was also putting together what had happened. I want nothing to do with this. I flew in last night and... He pulled off his backpack and dug around for something before pulling out the envelope. Is this what you thought he stole? He said it was contracts. Trust me, I don't know anything. He chucked the envelope at Liam. Before Liam could look inside, dude grabbed the envelope. That's mine. It's just nothing. I noticed that behind dude was a police officer, probably the one who was supposed to talk to me about Candy. He was watching dude carefully. Hey, dude, did you fight with Candy? Maybe she didn't want to kill Cold after all, and you got mad and pushed her in. If it was unplanned and she hit you, then maybe it's not your fault. No, I didn't touch her. She was fine when I left. She probably, like, slipped or something. She was really clumsy. He didn't sound all that confident in his own explanation. I didn't think the officer or the crowd was buying it either. I didn't know Candy's deal with Cold either, not until she told me this morning. She said to me that she wanted to get rid of him so we could be together. Told him about the fake death threats. I don't know where she got the idea that I wanted that. She was so stupid, I just left. I did steal the envelope because she said she made the death threat when she spent the night. What if there's my DNA on it? The police would think I had something to do with it. He was breathing deeply and the crowd pulled away from him. When the officer stepped up to him, dude saw him and for a second I thought he was going to run. But instead he sighed and put his hands up. Chapter 14. It was Sunday afternoon and so hot that even in the shade I was having to mop sweat off my brow before it got into my eyes and burned. I had one arrow left to go, and even though I was pretty sure I was about to lose the round, I was determined to shoot the best shot possible. I had shot and won two matches already. The first round was against an archer who had shot a lower score than me in qualifications. Theoretically, I was supposed to win the match, but in head-to-head matches, you could never let your guard down. That was what my second match opponent had learned when I knocked her out of the bracket, a surprise to both of us. I quickly cast a glance behind me to where Liam was standing in the shade with Moo. Both looked calm and collected, in contrast to the thundering blood in my own ears. Crowds were watching, though silent. He gave me a quick nod that I took to mean that I should focus on my shot. I guessed that because he had said it to me several times that morning. He had a calm, steady energy around him, and just standing near him, I felt more confident. Even Moo was less goofy and seemed to know how seriously I needed to focus. I pulled the bow back into my anchor and focused on the targets three quarters of a football field away. 
My instinct was to try to control the motion and just force that arrow into the middle, but I shouldn't. I needed to shoot my shot to trust the process, to keep my rhythm. I pulled back, and when the clicker went off, I loosed the arrow. I stared at the center of the gold circle in the middle of the target and kept my follow through until I heard the faint thunk of the arrow hitting the mat. I checked my scope to see that it was a 10, the highest score possible for that arrow. Jess stepped over. Great shot. You finished so strong. I nodded, trying to balance out my disappointment that I had lost the match with the fact that I had shot really well. I stepped over to shake my opponent's hand and congratulate her on a good match. We walked down to the targets where we scored and signed each other's scorecards. I wished her the best on her next match, turned in my scorecard to a judge, then went over to see Liam. Brian, the officer from Wyoming, was standing next to him. Brian, what are you doing here? I came to watch you shoot. Great job. I don't think I could do as well with everyone watching. A smile came across my whole face. Thanks, but I doubt you came all the way here to do that. Do you have news? He laughed and cut to the chase. I brought that memory card and met with the detectives down here, sharing what I knew of Candy and our case. They were able to use the information to treat cold. Last I had heard, he was in a medically induced coma, and they weren't sure he'd pull through. Is he going to be okay? Maybe. He has a long road ahead of him. But between the video, the pathologist report from up north, and the doctors at the hospital, it looks like he'll pull through. Plus, Dude admitted to knowing a bit more about what was happening than he claimed. He knew that Candy had been putting something in Cold's drugs. The irony is that Cold was clean and probably never would have taken that last hit, except finding out that Candy was dead pushed him over the edge, and he gave in to temptation. And Dude killed Candy? He's still claiming that she slipped or tripped or something, but I heard they have evidence that someone pushed her from behind, so I doubt his defense will hold up. That's great. It pretty much all worked out. I hadn't forgotten that you hid that memory card from me. We are all grabbing dinner tonight, and you're paying, and you need to fix my laptop. I sighed. It was probably more than fair. How long are you in town? He slid on his sunglasses. As long as I can be. Peace out, sunshine. He strode away. Liam chuckled. I think the sun fried his brain. I laughed, but even in my ears it felt fake. Liam pulled me in close. Despite the heat and the layer of dusty sweat stuck to every inch of me, I leaned into him. He wrapped his arms around me and whispered in my ear, I'm really proud of you. I held on to him until I felt I was about to burst into flames from more than just the literal temperature outside. Thanks. You are just so amazing. I can't believe how lucky I am. He pulled me in tight, his breath tickling my ear, my arms locked behind his back as he leaned down and kissed me. I felt content and loved, and, more than that, respected and valued. Liam had always been calm and easygoing, and over the course of our relationship, he had become my rock. He had total faith in my ability to take care of myself, but he also had no problem declaring his feelings for me and defending me publicly. I let out a long sigh as he pulled his lips from mine and looked into my eyes. The only thing that would have made that a hundred times better would be a declaration of undying love. I love you so much, he said with a smile. My heart fluttered as I replied, I love you too. I had just moved in for another kiss when Mary called my name. Da, you need to get over here and cheer for Minx. Her match is next, then Tiger's, then mine. They're running them one at a time. She didn't even wait, but turned and ran back toward where the next match was starting. I turned around to Liam. You heard the lady. We're needed. Liam took my hand in his and kissed my knuckle, a twinkle in his eyes. We definitely are. The End This has been Death in the Desert, Target Practice Mystery 7. Written by Nikki Haverstock. Narrated by the author. For more information about Nikki Haverstock, go to NikkiHaverstock.com.